Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Atlantic Live President Margaret Lowe. Hello, hello, hello. It's wonderful to see such a packed house. I am Margaret Lowe, I'm president of Atlantic Live, and it is such a treat to welcome you to this forum on the launch pad, Return to Deep Space. I think it's fair to say that space has captured the American imagination for generations, and it was 56 years ago this month when President John Kennedy told Congress that this nation should commit itself to landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. I suspect today he might have said a man or a woman, but I, I think you get the idea. Uh, President Trump has pledged to get an a American astronaut to Mars by the 2030s, if not sooner. And earlier this year, he signed a one-year funding bill giving NASA nearly $20 billion. So we're here today to explore what it will take to launch a team of astronauts into deep space, have them land on Mars, and then return safely to Earth. This afternoon, we'll talk about the science, the engineering, the required computing power, and the politics of a mission to Mars. We'll also talk about what it will take to enable a human being to endure such conditions of a mission. We've got a really excellent lineup for you today, from an astronaut to the acting administrator of NASA to Senator Ted Cruz, who chairs the Subcommittee on Space, Science, and Competitiveness. And it's important to note that none of this would have been possible without the great support of our underwriter, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Thank you so much for helping us bring this conversation to life. And at the end of the day, I should note, I encourage everyone here to swing by the HPE display. It's a showcase from The Machine. It's the largest R&D program in the company's history. And as they say, reinventing computing as we know it. Some practical notes before we begin. Please silence your cell phones or set them to stun. That one's for you Trekkie fans. But don't put them away because we're on Twitter at Atlantic Live with the hashtag Atlantic Space and you should join the conversation there and in the room too because we'll have time for your questions throughout the afternoon. And now let's roll and forgive me for two puns in one paragraph. Perhaps I should say, let's lift off. Our first conversation was with Robert Lightfoot. He's acting administrator for NASA. He's been the agency's associate administrator since 2012 and first joined NASA nearly three decades ago. Before that, he was head of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. And here to lead the conversation is Atlantic Live contributor, Allison Stewart. Allison, take it away. So we've decided to go with first names, Robert. Yep. So uh, 2033, it's mid-May 2017, that's about 15 and a half years. So, but 15 and a half years ago, if you had said to somebody, I'm going to tweet to my million followers from my iPhone, people would not know what you were talking about. So 15 years is a long time. The question is, as one person put it, there's nothing technically impossible about putting a man on Mars. That's correct, right? There's a few challenges, but no, it's not impossible. You've talked about the little M's to get to the big M's. What are the four phases that you've laid out that you believe will get us there? Yeah, I think for us, the, when we talk about the big M, the big M is actually getting to Mars. That's the big mission, and it takes several little missions along the way to get there, and they're not little, by the way. <laughs> um, my guys would be irritated with me for saying that, but, but really what, the way we're looking at it is we're looking at using low Earth orbit today, space station. Uh, the International Space Station is kind of our linchpin for the initial beginnings of technologies that we need to do, learning about the human body. Um, you think about what Scott Kelly did with the one-year mission so we can understand um, what happens to the human body in the microgravity environment. You'll have Micah Lay up here later, mm -hmm. and he can, I'm sure he'll be able to share some of that as well. Um, but that's an important piece, the technologies you need to demonstrate, life support systems, things like that. So that's kind of the low Earth orbit, the area 200 miles above your head. We've been up there for a while. You can see it go over. If you haven't ever seen it, it's the brightest, brightest star in the sky. Um, that's kind of a proving ground for us locally. We're also using that to enable the commercial industry. We've got SpaceX, Orbital ATK, and, and, and Boeing, all participating in ways to, to bring things to the, to the space station, kind of trying to get this industrial base in the country going to support all these steps, because we need them to. Bigelow is up there with an a, a mo expandable module on the station. Again, testing systems out that we're going to need. The next phase will be somewhere in the vicinity of the moon, where we can take these systems out, we can do a, a, a shakedown of them, kind of building the infrastructure we're going to need. If you can think about a, a highway system here in the United States, 
that, imp that interstate system, you need a system that allows us to travel back and forth. So we're going to test those out around the moon. And, then hope, and that's kind of what we're going to do in the decade of the 2020s, build the systems we need to do that for a longer duration than just on station. And then ultimately, we'll press to Mars. Um, and in the meantime, we, while we're working today, we're still working on technologies for landing on Mars, even though we're in these three phases. So that's what we're doing. Let me unpack a little bit of that. Yeah. Um, tell me what you believe will be the long-term impact of the um, uh, of private partnerships coming in with NASA. Yeah, I think for me, I've been talking about it being a big and for a while. It's not, it's not an or. A lot of people want to drive you into an or. And I think the longer-term impact will be similar to what we saw in Apollo. There's a whole industrial, industrial base that we'll build in this country. And that's, to me, economic security for the country uh, as well as it is. We don't know what we're going to learn yet. Right? This, is, this is definitely a journey, not a destination. And every, every step along the way, we're learning things that not just support us to get to Mars, but they support us here on Earth. And I think that's the, th that's the part that'll come out of this. It'll be fascinating. Why do you think people go to the or rather than the and? I think it's easy, right? I think it's easy to just go to the or because we're kind of a competitive society. Um, and I think what we're trying to do here, this grand challenge of trying to put humans on Mars and just, just even pushing humans deeper into space than we've ever done before, if you think about that. It's going to take the international community. It's going to take the best of our industries in this country, and it's going to take the government investment piece of that as well. So I think I think it's just I think the, the enormity of the tasks that we have in front of us is what's going to take all of us. How will the international community come into this discussion? Yeah, they're they're already in the discussion. We use them on the International Space Station. We have 15 countries there today uh, helping us with that. It's that's proven to us to, as a good model for how you do global engagement and diplomacy. Mm -hmm. um, NASA is kind of a soft power in that area, and it's been actually fascinating to watch how that has played out over the years we've been on station. We, we are talking to the international partners constantly about our, our journey to Mars and what we're trying to do from that perspective. And they have niche areas they would like to participate in. So that's what, we're, that's what we're talking to them about. What are those conversations? What are those niche areas? Oh, well, you've got, you've got uh, the, the Europeans clearly like, they like the idea of going to the moon, right? Mm -hmm. But the systems they would like to come with us as we go, that's what they've talked about for a while. They have strength in uh, building structures. The nodes that we have on station were built by the Italians. Um, the, the shells were by the Italians. The Russians clearly have engagement with us on the station today, um, providing transportation, but also some of the systems that we use on station. The Japanese have been involved with us on a bunch of areas. And from an experimental perspective, they've expressed interest to us in life support systems, long-term life support systems we may need. I mean, that's just some of the examples. You made a little news over the weekend. There was some discussion. The mm -hmm. president wanted to have a manned, uh, a potential, wanted you to research that possibility of putting a man as part of the SLS Orion rocket going out in 2019, is it 2019? Mm -hmm. And you decided to study that. Tell me what exactly you were studying. Yeah, we, first we, we know what the answer is. First, it's crude, not manned. Crew, sorry. Let's be really crew. careful here. Sorry. Because uh, I don't want to assume. Yes, I'm uh, a garden variety journalist, not a space journalist, so Got please, it. please. So crude mission. No, uh, what Correct. we were at, the administration asked us when they first came on board, could we put crew on EM-1, Exploration Mission 1 for us, which is the first launch of uh, the Space Launch System in Orion. Um, we did a good study on that, took a long look at it, and really why it's technically feasible, when you looked at the overall plan and the resources that were needed, the schedule that was going to be needed, um, and, and then some of the increase in technical risk, it really just kind of reaffirmed the plan we were on, is, is we need to fly the first mission uncrewed, um, and then that'll, that'll make the second mission with the crew much more, much more safe. It's a better, better risk reduction strategy for us going forward for the, for the longer term of what we're trying to do. Can you tell us a little more about those risks? Yeah, the, um, one of the things that we had planned on when you're doing a test flight, uh, you, can, you can get a lot of data back that'll give you some confidence. The heat shield, for instance, on the Orion spacecraft, we, we really needed the test flight to test that. We could have done some things on the ground, but we probably would have never gotten to the level of risk reduction that we would prefer. Could have gotten there. It was definitely feasible. Uh, the software, just getting the software done, we, had, we don't have the software for the displays and the activities that the, the crew needs. Mm -hmm. We'd have to turn those on pretty quickly and get them going. And then really, the, the big one is the life support system associated with the, uh, with the test. Finally, the, 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 probably the biggest piece was with an uncrewed mission, we can really test the system. We're going to run a pretty aggressive mission profile. If we had crew for the first time, we would go in a much uh, kind of a, we'd go to a high Earth orbit, make sure all the systems are working, and then go out toward the moon. We don't have to worry about that with no crew. We're just going to take it straight to the moon and, and, and test the system. It's a pretty, pretty rigorous test, and we thought that was the better way to go. When you say aggressive, what does that mean? Uh, it just means that we're going um, to... I don't want to imply that EM-1 is 
doesn't have some risk to it. I mean, we're, we're pushing the envelope here. We haven't done this. And, and so what we want to do is take the Orion spacecraft and test it as hard as we can. In other words, we're going to have the highest return velocity we can get from the moon, which is the big test of the heat shield, mm -hmm. so that when we put Creole on the next mission, we'll have confidence in that system. One of the numbers that I read, and, and please, again, correct me if I'm wrong, that it might have cost an extra 600 to $900 million. Where would that money have gone? Well, it, it would have gone to the systems I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. A lot of the money was already planned for the next mission, and we would have had to accelerate it and bring it forward to, to do that. But some of the others was for some extra testing we wanted to do, specifically around the heat shield, um, getting the software team on board quicker, mm -hmm. th those kind of activities. So it was really some testing ascent abort. We were going to do an ascent abort test after exploration mission one, we would have had to pull it forward to do it before. So it was really as much as phasing thing. But I, you know, cost really to me, it was more the integrated look at the cost of schedule and the technical risk we were taking. And just, again, it reaffirmed those plans that we already had in place. Something that's sort of interesting and rare these days is that the funding for this program and for that bill had huge bipartisan support, mm -hmm. something we don't see a lot of these days. Why do you think that is? Huh, that's a great question. Uh, we've been pretty blessed by that. The, the administration and the Congress have supported NASA for a while, and I think people look at NASA as a um, uh, we look at they look at it as a symbol of leadership for the country, right? It's a, it's a good thing. Um, if you look at our social media presence and the team, our team does a great job, um, really reaching out to the public and, and showing the public what we're doing, and, and we get tremendous interest. I mean, anywhere from if you go back to Trappist One, where we discovered the Earth-like planets. Four billion hits on social media for that, right? Um, you just see a, a, a tremendous amount of presence in terms of what we're trying to do because we're trying to really, you know, we're, we're basically changing textbooks, you know, and, and I think that pursuit of knowledge and that scientific discovery um, really intrigues uh, most people that this is a good thing. It's not a, it's not, you know, it's, it's different than some of the other things people talk about in the government. You sound very enthused. There's many people who are scientists say that science is under assault in many parts of the world. Yeah, I don't. But you sound enthused about this. I, I'm very enthused. I think, I think. And optimistic, I guess. Yeah, I, I think we've got a great plan. I think you see how NASA did um, in the 2018 skinny budget that came out. We did really well compared to a lot of other agencies. And I think, again, it's that, it's a value proposition that we bring um, not only for the nation, but really globally, um, that, that what we're trying to do, you know, it's kind of, I like to say it's written in our hearts, right? This is, this is what we, we want to be, we want to explore. We want to push forward. And I think NASA is the, probably the symbolic piece of that. NASA and our, and our, all our partners, academia, this industry in this country is ready to push forward. I mean, that's so, so, so exciting about it. You see people just get really enthusiastic about what we're trying to do. That number, that $19.5 billion, is that enough? I think it's, I think it's for us, for our plans, it will help us. We will be our plans with that number. Really? Yep. You're never going to hear anybody at NASA go, we, we don't want any more. <laughs> I mean, that's not, that's not the way we're going to be. But, but for us, for what we ask for, this is, this is exactly what we need to go do the job we've been asked to go do. Well, here's a question. If, if you could have unlimited funding <laughs> to, to throw at this, what, where would it go immediately? Yeah. And how would that affect? I mean, uh, what we would do the is time we, frame. Yes. So there's a couple of things that we would do. We would ex we would uh, accelerate some of the risk reduction activities we need to do, which is, means we'd start building hardware earlier um, than we are planning right now. Right now, we're very phased. Like you said earlier, it's a very phased approach, and we could probably accelerate some of that. Um, but that would be the area that we would that we would focus on is just accelerating that hardware we need. We need a we need that infrastructure system around the moon, which is a habitat, and then a, a, a way to transport folks from there to Mars, right? And that's and landers when we get there. I mean, these are these are complex systems that we would probably could we accelerate um, moving forward. But we're not going to accelerate that much. I think it's just I think we've got a good, steady approach based on the resources we've been given. I'm pretty confident we can do it. Tell me a little bit about uh, what you see as the agenda for POTUS 45 versus. 44 and 43. You've been at NASA for nearly 30 years now, so give us a little bit of hindsight there. Yeah, I see what I've seen so far is is um, support for what we're trying to do. Um, I think that's that's to me. I, I've seen a con with the signing of the 2017 Transition Authorization Act, and you're going to have Senator Cruz here later. He and Senator Nelson were the two stalwarts behind getting that done. And um, when the president signed that, that gave us constancy of purpose, is what we like to say. Just a continuation of what we've been doing for a while, and I think, honestly, Allison, that's that's the the one thing we need. When you're talking multi-decadal mm -hmm. kind of programs like we're doing here and what we're trying to do, 
um, you need that stability over time. And, it, and if you think about the International Space Station, I forget how many it is, but there's 30 some odd heads of states that changed, administrators change, and, you, and, and you've got to have that constancy of purpose to allow you to be doing these long-term programs. Um, and that's what we saw from the administration so far, and obviously from Congress with what they did with the uh, 17 omnibus. Did you have that stability previously? We, I think we've always had that stability. Uh, that's one thing NASA has been able to, to survive through multiple um, administrations for this reason. That's why the station's up there. The station took a long time. To, the International Space Station took a long time to build. This next transportation agenda we have will take a long time to build as well. When you talk about the space station, it's obviously a source of pride. Mm -hmm. uh, what made it successful and what can you learn from <laughs> it that you can apply to this plan for Mars? Yeah, I think... Uh, the, the, for us, the station is kind of our, it's, it, it is our, right now, it's our shining star up there. It's our jumping off platform, and, and we're learning so much there. The engineering marvel that it is, I, I, you know, when we landed on the moon, that was an incredible thing. That was an incredible event. I call it a civilization-level changing event, right? Um, when, you, when you look at the station, it's just incredible what we do every day. We're operating in space. We've been there for a while. We've got Peggy Whitson up there right now, who's the longest-serving person, the longest time in space, cumulative time in space, uh, just short of Mike L.A. for EVA now. Uh, he's still got her beat there. Still got the record. Yeah, he's still, <laughs> got, he's still got her beat. I'm sure she's coming after him. Uh, <laughs> but, but, and then you've got, a, you've got a rookie like Jack Fisher on there with, with her, right? For, and, and then the international partners. So what we've learned is we can cooperate internationally. Mm -hmm. We can survive a lot of things that are happening here on Earth, and they don't seem to affect us in our ability to co cooperate in space. Um, and we cooperate for the right reasons. I think we're trying to all, again, it's all about that pursuit of knowledge, that, that scientific discovery that we're trying to do, whether it's the human body or whether it's just science in general. So that's what we've learned is that you can do this. You can actually pull off a very complex engineering uh, challenge. Well, what errors or what missteps or, wow, we could have done that better on the ISS that you can apply? Yeah, I'm sure there's several. Um, I think I, I would say for the most part, Nothing, nothing big, obviously, because we're up there. Um, I think the, the there, we have day-to-day -day challenges. I mean, you can see the, just the spacewalk we did this past week. The teams did an incredible job recovering that spacewalk. It was going to be a lot shorter and not get as much done, but the teams come together and have a great process. I would call it just the day-to-day -day things that we have to do. They aren't errors. They just show the skill set of our people and what our people can do when they're faced with a challenge. Because it's hard to operate, you know, 200 feet, 200 miles above us here. Um, in the vacuum of space, and you watch them do it every day. Um, I think, it, you know, the, some, the, one of the best things we've done is, is bring the commercial entities to bring our cargo to station. When we retired the space shuttle, we now have orbital ATK and SpaceX bringing us cargo to station on a pretty routine basis, and it's a very resilient process that we've got going, even though we've had some incidents there. So you can see that we've got a supply chain now, we've got a kind of building this, this industrial base as we go forward, and I think that's the part that's been the most successful around ISS. When you think about deep space exploration, do you think about it in terms of study, or do you think about Mars in terms of settlement? Well, I think it's a go-do. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a study. Uh, we stu <laughs> we've, we've studied it for a long time, and uh, I, I feel like for, for probably... At least in my career, I feel like the, the momentum is there. I mean, the teams are ready to go. A lot of people in this room are on those teams. Um, and they really like that horizon destination, right? And we've got a lot of work to go to get there. But uh, I think most people realize we can, not only can we do it, we will do it, right? If we, keep, if we just keep that constancy of purpose. And so to me, I, I hope, you know, I hope we can make the Martian the movie, the Martian the reality mm -hmm. uh, going forward. And I think that's what... I think that's what our teams are striving to do today. What did you think of that movie? I thought it was great. Yeah. I, well, I, as I told people, I said, uh, my, my wife made me, I probably shouldn't, Stephanie's going to shoot me here, but I, I uh, <laughs> Stephanie, my, my wife, my wife uh, made me bring all our neighbors, and so I'm the only one that works at NASA, so the movie was more questions. I was like, can I just watch what? the movie? <laughs> <laughs> I just kept, oh, anyway. What did they want to know? That, is that real? Does that, that happen? Real? Can that go on? And you know, it was it was interesting. I, I, I um, enjoyed I enjoyed seeing it because there's a lot of the pieces. You know, Andy, we worked with NASA quite a bit, mm -hmm. so it was it was pretty realistic in terms of what the challenges are. I think the part that that was interesting was there was already a lot of stuff there at Mars that we're trying to build now, and I said that's not fair. They started with it already there, <laughs> so so it was so it was good. But but it was it, I thought it was a pretty good ad adaptation of what we what we expect to do. This is a little bit of a, a softball question, but. 
how does pop culture fit into your world? Yeah, does I think, it affect it at all? Or does I, it? I, th I don't know if it affects it so much. I think it's a good way for us to engage with the public mm -hmm. in a different way than maybe we would have in the past. And uh, we, we enjoy, I mean, all of us, we're, I mean, at some level, the folks that work at NASA, this is as much a hobby as it is a job, right? Because we love what we get to do every day. And I think being involved with the pop culture is, it, those movies, you know, I've had people ask me if we've been to, uh, what is it, Pandora? I'm like, no, you know, from Avatar. I'm like, <laughs> I, I don't think so. Uh, not, not since I've been there. And so, so I mean, so, so it, you, you get a lot of that kind of, you get a lot of that kind of questions. But for the most part, you know, I, I'll give you an example. My daughter called me just this weekend and said, have you seen Interstellar? The, you know, the mm -hmm. Matthew McConaughey. Um, and, and she immediately turns the phone and gives it to a friend of hers who's just, uh, probably as big a geek as me, right? And this person starts asking me all these questions about it. I'm like, oh my God, I don't know, right? Just from that standpoint, I enjoyed the movie just like you did. I try to go to the movie to watch the movie. Uh, but there, but there's a, the, the inevitable questions that you'll get from that standpoint. But I think it's a very important piece of what we, how we engage with the public mm -hmm. and what we're doing. And our comms team, I, I give them a lot of credit. They have been able to probably expand that gap from the, you know, the, the old rigid engineer to talking to folks that don't know what we're doing so much. And I think that's an important way for us to communicate with the public in terms of what we're doing. And they've, they've done a great job doing that. Make it more real, you know, down to earth. No pun intended. <laughs> we need to have a pun jar for this yeah. whole afternoon. <laughs> When I was watching the movie Hidden Figures, one of the things that struck me was the, and I know obviously this is a plot device, but that idea of the race, the idea of you mentioned how we are competitive beings and wanting to be first. And that was sort of a galvanizing thing. It's what everybody could surround themselves around. What is it about the Mars mission that we can, that we can get everyone uh, engaged with and surround and, ch and cheer for and root for that yeah. way? And first of all, it was a great movie, wasn't it? it I mean, was it was a, a fantastic movie. Um, and then just, incredible story of some fantastic women down at down at Langley Research Center in Virginia so really proud to see that that get done I, th I think for us the 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 rallying cry is again I think it's that civilization and human aspect of we need to keep exploring it's kind of in our DNA we want mm -hmm. we want to learn more we want to push more and and for me I think Mars is the place to go think that's what we should do and I think most of our team is, is ready to try to do it it's going to be tough right this is not going to be easier we would already done it uh, but but it is going to and it's going to take that constancy of purpose and I think um, you know if you if you just fast forward right and you think for those of you that were there when we when we walked on the moon can you imagine the first steps on Mars you know and somebody has walked on Mars can you imagine how that's going to feel and I remember seeing, we, we, we looked at all the headlines, somebody sent this to me, all the headlines when, we, when, we, when Neil Armstrong took that first step on, on the moon. And globally it was, we did it, right? It was the human race that pulled that off, not just, the, not just NASA, not just the US. It was, the, it was a global, like, like I said, civilization level change event for us. And I think that to me, that's the, that's the thing you'll see when we, when we walk on Mars. I mean, I really believe that. So that's what I think is important. We've got about four minutes left. I'm going to ask one more question and then open it up to the audience for questions. So think about this. I'm the, this is just a personal question. Where were you when, uh, do you remember the moon landing? Uh, yeah, I do. I was very, very young, uh, but I was alive. I was, uh, I, I will do that. So uh, yeah, I was, I remember watching with my dad, right? And my dad, who happens to be my hero, um, you know, he's the one that went out and started building model rockets after that and, and mm -hmm. drug me out there with him can remember thinking, what are we doing? But anyway, so he laughs, he laughs to this day because he's got pictures of me fly, flying an old Saturn V Estes model rocket that uh, I was clearly not interested. I was over digging, <laughs> I was over digging in the dirt. And so uh, the first picture he ever had of a shuttle launch that, that uh, I was involved in, he said, this is, he, had, he, had, he built one of these pictures of me at the shuttle launch and this picture of me digging in the dirt and said, he says, I guess I planted some seeds. You know, so, anyway, but, but I think, yeah, I remember that. And I remember, you know, I, probably one of the most favorite time in my career was um, Neil Armstrong came to Huntsville to, to speak at an event. And I got to sit and eat dinner with him. Oh, wow. I, and, and it was like, wow. I told my, I told my guys at, the, at the, uh, the photographers, I said, you better get a picture. <laughs> right? I got to have a picture of this. So it was, it was great. Because you hear the stories. And when you talk to people like that, very humble very, um, you know, almost, almost this reality, the same reality we're in today. You, I tell my guys all the time, you know, you're making history. You just don't know it, right? Because if you go back and ask the Apollo guys 
you know, what, did you know you were making history? And they'll say, no, I was just doing my job, right? And so when you look back, there is a historical aspect that comes into play. And that, to me, is the other piece I try to pull on with our teams. Mm -hmm. Questions from the audience? Hi. Hi, my name is Marshall Banks, and I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Can you talk about the status of the asteroid redirect mission and whether it is going to go forward or not? Yeah, I think we're going to, we're, we're planning on not going forward with the asteroid redirect mission. And we're, but, but the key for the asteroid redirect mission is we're going to take advantage of the technologies we develop, the solar electric propulsion um, effort that we have. Uh, that, that has actually proven to be a technology we can use in this journey to Mars. Um, and I think we're going to continue that. Uh, as we go forward. So I know the technology guys will keep doing this. We call it SEP, Solar Electric Propulsion. They'll keep doing the SEP work for sure. We're going to complete that because we need it on a bus we're going to use for part of our uh, infrastructure that we're building as we go to Mars. It's actually a really awesome system that we can use now. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, John Wetmore with pedestrians.org. Uh, what does your unmanned uh, exploration of Mars look like? It's different if you're preparing for a manned mission, then if there's no manned mission on the horizon, what do you do differently? That's a great question. So let me see if I got your, if I didn't have the human mission to Mars, what would I do scientifically? Is that what? Your, your, the difference your, between the your, two. Your unmanned probes. You oh, know, you have okay. a long series of them going back many years. Yep. What do you do differently going forwards if you're preparing for yeah. man versus nothing in sight? Yeah, great question. Um, and and uh, Ellen Stofan, who's after me, can talk a little bit about the science we've been doing. But what we did, on Curiosity, the one that's, the rover that's on Mars now, we added a radiation uh, sensor to that particular mission so we could understand better the radiation environment because we're worried about what that would do for humans. On 2020, we're adding a, um, an instrument called MOXIE, which is going to hopefully pull oxygen out of the atmosphere of, uh, of, of Mars, and so we can see if we can actually reproduce it. It's almost an in-situ resource utilization kind of experiment that's going to go on there. So those are the, we're starting to talk about space we can use on these spacecraft that go for science missions. Can we actually designate some space to get ready for the human mission? Hope that answered your question. And I think we have time for one more. Aida Awad, Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellow. Uh, recognizing that earlier NASA missions made a tremendous impact on encouraging students to follow their path in STEM, what would you recommend to STEM educators as a message to students now to be involved in programs in the next, up to 2033? It's a great question. Um, I, I think for me, the way, what, I, what I hope we do is I hope we, it's, it's, we, we've talked about encouraging kids to stay in STEM for a while. I think we also need to talk about retaining kids that actually get interested in STEM. I, what I've seen quite often is when it gets hard, we sometimes, uh, the, the kids will walk, walk away, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, it's, I think the retention piece of this is something I really want people to encourage. If there's a spark, we ought to just keep fanning it, right? And don't let them walk away, because they'll walk away, right? I mean, I watched it with my, one of my daughters. It just kills me. She should be an engineer. She walked away, because it got hard, right? And I think that's where you need that encouraging piece. Um, going forward, and to me, that was the, um, that's what I, I think we have a great effort in this country to keep STEM on the forefront, keep people, in, to get people interested in STEM. I think the next step we need to take is now how do we get them to stay there? That's my take. And that's a great place to end. All right. Join me in welcoming, thanking Robert Lightfoot. All right, thanks, Allison. Thank you. Thank you. And that way. And now, making the checklist, please welcome Ellen Stofan, former chief scientist for NASA and Atlantic senior editor, Ross Anderson. Ellen, thank you for being with us today. Uh, this is sort of a, a geeky voice dream uh, to sit here and drill you with questions. Um, before we get into kind of the mechanics of how a Mars mission works, I want to interrogate the idea that we should be going to Mars. Um, the way I see it from the layperson's perspective, there's sort of three interesting missions in the next 20 years that we could potentially pull off. There's a lander on Europa or Enceladus that could possibly sample its ocean for signs of life. Uh, there's a big space telescope that could sample maybe the nearest thousand stars or so uh, to see if their atmospheres contain uh, gases that indicate life. And then there's this mission to put, you know, a small amount of human geologists on the surface of Mars. How do you stack those? I mean, how do, how do you prioritize them? 
Well, I think it's interesting that those are the three you described because um, to me, they're all around the same theme of really trying to get at the answer to this question of are, are we alone? A and what's amazing to me is that we're all alive and ready at this unique time period where we know <laughs> where to go, we know what to measure. In general, we have the technology or we know the path to get on to get to obtain the technology to be able to actually answer these questions. So, you know, Robert was talking about it's, it's not or, it's and. Um, I'm gonna go with and. You know, all three of those missions to me are critical. Is there life beyond our universe? Um, how easy is it to form life on an Earth-like planet, which is the Mars question, because you know, about four billion years ago, Mars was pretty much like the Earth, and so mm. we think that life would have evolved there. Then to me, the icy satellites of the outer solar system give us you know, this further data point of what about in any non-Earth-like subsurface ocean, how easy is it to get life there? So that's gonna, again, help us with that question of understanding the ubiquity of, or not of life beyond our solar system. How should we think about the sort of challenge ahead when it comes to Mars? So uh, in 1960, no human being had visited space and nine years later, uh, we had people on the moon. Um, are we at a sort of similar 1960s moment when it comes to Mars? I hope so, um, because I, I certainly witnessed that whole first challenge and us stepping up to the challenge. And, and sometimes people will argue about, do we need a goal, do we need a date? A and I would say yes to both of those, because to me, without that goal, without saying, we're gonna have humans in Mars orbit, by the early 2030s, mm -hmm. it's very easy to get off the path. It's easy to get distracted. It's easy not to be focused. And I think we are at this unique moment where we know where we wanna go. We understand the path of technologies that we need to get there. We think there's an affordable plan, which you know Robert Lightfoot was talking about earlier. And I, I think you've got broad public support. So everything to me is lining up to actually see this happen. And it's frustrating to me because Probably for the last 30 years, we've been saying we're going to get to Mars in 20 years. This time, I'm actually hoping it's going to happen. Yeah, it does seem like sort of the cold fusion type thing, right? Where it's like perpetually 15 years away. Um, what's the game plan right now? Like, so if, if you had to sort of give us a really broad sketch of a mission, like are we taking off from the moon or how is that going to work? Well, obviously, as Robert was talking about the big next step beyond the ISS, and Marilyn Demmer is going to be talking in a little bit about the criticality of the ISS for re the International Space Station for you know, getting those technologies ready um, for the next step, which is in the mid-2020s, to have a habitat out in orbit around the moon. Mm -hmm. Why we need that, that's really the test vehicle for the transfer vehicle. Remember, it's seven to eight months to Mars, so we're gonna need a habitat that's not too big, but big enough for, for you to have a crew that they're not gonna be totally on top of each other on that long trip. Uh, and we need to test that three or four days from the Earth, not just say, okay, let's build this and then send it seven or eight months out to Mars and hope for the best. We wanna really ring out the technologies, the systems on board that in orbit around the moon. Hmm. Then at some point around, we think around 2032, 2033, we'll be ready to send that first crew to Mars, probably just to orbit Mars, which is, which is good because we again, we need to focus on those technologies and we need to have an affordable plan and the exact architecture, will they leave from the Earth? It's more likely you'd leave from the orbit of the moon because that way you're out of the Earth's gravity well. You're probably gonna be putting together this habitat. It's not gonna be able to be launched all in one launch. So you'll, you'll uh, you know, construct it probably in, in a Earth orbit or lunar orbit and then go to Mars, head to Mars from there. Uh, around that same time, with all that activity happening around the moon, would, would that be, would you build a, a lunar colony up there during the same period? You know, every, every, time you, every time you focus on something, to me that puts Mars further away. Mm -hmm. um, and NASA determined a few years ago, you know, the technologies you le need for landing on the moon are quite different than the technology you need for landing on Mars. So every unique development has a price tag attached to it, and we only have so much money. On the other hand, a lot of our European partners, for example, are very interested in going to the surface of the moon. You see huge interest in going to the surface of the moon from the commercial sector. And so to me, if there's things that NASA can do to facilitate that, that's great, but let's keep NASA's resources focused on getting humans to Mars. Yeah. I know one of the big challenges with a, a Mars mission is that you don't wanna take much. Uh, you, you wanna pack sort of as little as possible for, right. the, for the road. 
What kinds of things can you find on the Martian surface uh, that you don't have to take with you? Well, you know, the most critical thing for human life is obviously water. Uh, you know, water is the most precious thing. Not only do, do, do humans need it, but you can use it to manufacture rocket fuel. So, and if there's one thing we know about Mars is there's a lot of water there. And so one of the things we're, that's been studied over the years is even for that first human landing on Mars, are you going to plan on having manufactured rocket fuel from Mars to come back, or are you going to launch that fuel from the Earth, take it to Mars, land it on the surface of Mars? Um, and so that's kind of an obvious trade that you think, all right, having in situ resource utilization at least for, for uh, your ascent vehicle from Mars would be a good thing to get from Mars. Some of the fun stuff that's been going on, and NASA's had some uh, challenges in this area, is what what else could you do? Mm -hmm. So we've been looking at things like, can you use Martian soil to make bricks to start making a, a more permanent habitat out of for the surface of Mars? What else could you build out of, out of Martian regolith uh, or, or dirt, as we like to call it? Um, what else could you build that would be, would be useful? And so we're really working on that right now. If you were to land near some of the ice uh, on Mars, would that severely limit your sort of landing locations? Uh, no, there's a lot of subsurface ice on Mars in various <laughs> places. Some of our, our orbital data from Mars have shown what appear to be possibly buried glaciers at fairly low latitudes, so you don't only have to go up to the polar regions to find uh, near-surface ice. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's actually already been a meeting of the scientific community to start talking about what would a human landing site look like, what are the characteristics because you probably want to build up infrastructure at the same site. So it's got to be somewhere interesting that you say, okay, there's lots for the scientists to do there. There's lots for those, those uh, Martian astronauts to be searching for evidence of past life, looking for fossils, but there's also resources there that they can utilize. A lot of people, when they watch science fiction, they have the mistaken impression that you can just sort of uh, talk in real time uh, with somebody who's on Mars, but that's not the case. There's a, a considerable delay. And I was wondering what sorts of scenarios uh, you all are, are gaming out. Like, what are, what are the real nightmare scenarios when you can't communicate immediately? Well, you know, I, I think it's hard for people to understand, but, you know, we really are in pretty, pretty constant contact with the astronauts up on the International Space Station, and that's just the way we've operated for so long, that to think that you'd go into a mode, whereas on our planetary on our planetary missions, I'm on the Cassini mission, and it takes us a long time to communicate with Cassini. So I'd say on the planetary side of NASA, we're very used to these long delay times when we command spacecraft. But obviously, when you have humans, that's a different risk posture, and you want to be as much in contact. But you can't fight physics here. You know, at mm. times, it's as much as a 20-minute time delay. And sometimes when I'm talking to audiences, I'm like, OK, there's the, let's put aside for a second the whole operational issue. Just on a personal level, you know, you haven't seen your family for seven months, and you, and you say, you know, hi to your spouse, and, and 40 minutes later you hear, what? Um, <laughs> you know, that's not going to do a lot, you know, for your mental state. So, so we have to work that in. It, it really is isolation that you, you can't get around. From an operational point of view, it's, again, this mode that we haven't been in before where um, Houston, we have a problem, is not really a great option mm -hmm. um, because the response is too slow. Um, so where do you go with that? And, and I have talked to a lot of AI experts over the last few years, and I keep saying, we need nice HAL, um, <laughs> friendly HAL, not mean HAL. That would be a bad thing. Um, so we've been actually, NASA's been doing things like working with the people from Watson and saying, you know, how can we use artificial intelligence? How can we use advanced computing to help with things like potentially something goes wrong, anomaly scenarios, have the computer now help mm -hmm. you help be mission control. Uh, just in general, what are the technologies? Like, say we were to go all in on Mars, and we set, we decide, yeah, the early 2030s, we're going. Um, uh, where, which tech sectors have the steepest development curve, and where are we sort of al already almost there? You know, we've done so much on the International Space Station. Again, Mary Lynn's going to be talking about this in, in a bit in terms of human health. Um, ex you know, astronauts exercising the importance of, of nutrition. There's a lot of that work that I'd say we've come really far, and by 2024, a lot of the issues of human health um, are, are going to be, we're going to be in good shape with that. Um, one of the things we still uh, struggle with, but we're certainly working on, is life support. I mean, just keeping the carbon dioxide levels uh, in, in the proper range on the ISS is still something we really work on. 
And over the next six years, there's plans to be testing sort of the next generation of life support systems. So um, the toilet, the toilet <laughs> breaks a lot. Um, you know, and you say you don't want to go on an eight month journey, even with four people you like really well and not have a working toilet, right? That's mm. a problem. So there's some mon mundane things, you know, that, that we're still working on. You but can't I wouldn't like go off the back or anything. <laughs> no, not an, no. not an option. <laughs> um, but I'd say I think all those are pretty tractable, and that's why I think getting mm. to Mars orbit with humans by 2032, technologically, there's not a lot of hugely tall tent poles. Mm. The biggest tent pole for getting to Mars, humans to Mars, is still landing on the surface. It's that entry, descent, and landing through that thin Mars atmosphere. It's not thick enough to slow you down. But, it's, it's, uh, but it is thick enough to really heat you up. It's kind of the worst of both worlds. So that is still our toughest technology area that we still need to work on. And that's part of the reason why I say, oh, Mars orbit with humans in 2032, not bad. Getting humans down to the surface, that would be a challenge because mm -hmm. of entry, descent, <clears throat> and landing. How much does it, uh, how applicable is our experience with uh, landing? I, I like to use the hour as though that I had any part in this. <laughs> um, but uh, how applicable is, it, is our experience uh, landing, say, Curiosity on the surface of the moon, uh, of Mars, to that problem? Curiosity weighed one metric ton. We estimate <clears throat> the stuff uh, that we need for humans on the surface is about 40 metric tons. And so even if you say, okay, you can split that up, um, but if you split it up, then once the humans get to the surface, you know, what are they going to do? Sit there with, you know, t you know, 20, you know, 41 ton boxes in front of them is, is not a, a great thing. So right. you have to say, so that's really what the technologists are working on is sort of what is the most massive thing we can get down to the surface um, by really pushing the technology. The good news is, for example, uh, NASA's partnership with SpaceX, hmm. um, they plan on landing one of their Red Dragon capsules on the surface of Mars. That would push the technology up to four to five metric tons. So it's starting to move in the right in the right direction, but you see the problem: one metric ton, even five, that's great. We still got to get up in the twenty, you know, ten, fifteen, twenty metric ton. We'll get there. It, it, it's just it's just time and money. <laughs> um, you talked about Hal uh, and your desire for us to have a nice Hal to go on a mission <laughs> like this. Um, what happens if Hal breaks uh, in situ? What do you do? <clears throat> um, you know, the one thing, and, you know, Michael uh, Lopez Alegria is here, you know, he can tell you, the one thing astronauts do is they train and they train and they train and they train, mm -hmm. and then they train some more. <laughs> um, and they practice everything that can go wrong, and they practice it some more. Um, and so, obviously, you have to decide what are the most important systems that you need to have redundancy in, where can you not have redundancy. Um, but ultimately, it's always going to come down to training, uh, and how flexibly you've built your architecture, how much you can recover. I'm not thinking we're going to be in any kind of Martian situation. <laughs> um, tell me about the risks to the human body. Uh, there's, a, there's an entire panel on this later, but uh, cosmic radiation in particular, is that just a risk that uh, astronauts are going to have to live with? Um, I, I think so to some extent because um, galactic cosmic mm. rays come in at such a high rate of speed that you mm. really can't shield against them the way we can with solar radiation. Um, I think, you know, we've, NASA works with the Institute of Medicine to, to think about the ethics. Uh, you know, we've, there's been a lot of modeling that's been done to try to understand what the effects of that radiation would be on the human body. And right now what we've found out is that it's not a showstopper, but it's certainly mm -hmm. an area of concern. Um, mm -hmm. I think that when you look at the rate of, of medical advances of personalized medicine, um, by 2032, 2033, we're not going to be in the same place we are now in terms of understanding. And I've talked to, when I was chief scientist, I was talking to uh, a number of different uh, medical specialists, and they actually find this really interesting because when you're out in that mixed field radiation, getting solar radiation and cosmic radiation, it's an environment you really can't recreate here on the Earth. Mm. So, for example, when we have this habitat in orbit around the moon, it's a huge opportunity to do research on cellular and DNA repair mechanisms. So that's really critical for all of us here on Earth, is to understand why some of us, for example, are better repairers uh, of damage than others, because that's actually what keeps us maybe from getting cancer or not getting cancer. So the idea that you could be out in, in this mixed field radiation and doing these kind of experiments with tissue samples 
is actually a huge opportunity that could have really great benefits to human health. Mm. Um, and I think we're going to learn things about why people are better repairers than other others that are going to help us eventually, you know, possibly with therapies that will eventually help us when we're actually getting humans to Mars or on the surface of Mars for more extended periods of time out in the late 2030s. I want to uh, take a, a question or two from the audience in a minute, but first, uh, one argument that you sometimes hear in space circles is the idea that NASA has actually gotten too careful with its human astronauts, that um, given that this is a frontier exploration activity in the past, and in, in the high renaissance when people were uh, uh, sailing the Atlantic, they were, they were more comfortable with human casualties uh, and injuries. And that, that uh, Do you think that's a problem? Do you think that's holding us back? Um, I don't, I don't think it's holding us back. I think, I think when you look at, um, say you're doing a planetary mission in, in the discovery, our, our smallest category, which is still a lot of money, it's $450 million. You're going to take on an amount of risk when you say, all right, it's, it's this much money and we're trying to accomplish this kind of science. When you're asking humans to put their lives on the line for, in a sense, for the rest of us who want to be armchair explorers, right? We all want to go to Mars too, but we're going to let them kind of do it for us and we're going to sit here and watch or it's nice and safe. <coughs> I think you really have to say, have, have we taken a good look at all the known risks? Do we understand what the potential unknowns are? And have we beaten the risk down to a level that we would actually feel comfortable asking someone to go do that? Mm -hmm. That's with the, the idea that we know that things can happen that we just can't predict sure. or we don't have the ability to predict. So it's never going to be safe. Cool. And, and I think all of us in this room are probably used to seeing, you know, uncrewed vehicles that we lose. Uh, and I, I think you say, all right, this is just before we ever put astronauts out there, we're going to make sure the risk is as low as possible. But the risk is never going to be zero. Hmm. They're explorers, they're pushing the frontier, but let's do it responsibly. Sure. Uh, any questions from the audience? Oh, thanks. Hi, I'm Tamara Arrowood from Cydiva. Um, NASA has been very open and uh, supportive of citizen science projects. And I was wondering, do you foresee citizen, sci <laughs> citizen science projects making more of a significant impact in the work that's done at NASA? You know, citizen science was something I started working on in NASA a couple years ago, and I'm particularly passionate about it. Um, b because to me, um, we need people looking over our shoulder, but not just looking over our, our shoulder, but actually participating. And so uh, when we started talking about this whole journey to Mars, we started talking about how can we build in citizen science um, from the beginning a as an aspect of it, not something that we add on later, like, oh, wouldn't this be nice? How are we going to get people involved? But as we're thinking, all right, we're going to do this cislunar habitat, and then we're going to move, be moving humans to Mars. At some point, we're hopefully going to do a Mars sample return. How can we bring the public along with us in a really significant way? We do it already in fun ways. We have a, a, um, a program that if none of you have ever tried, I found it really stressful. Um, it's called Disk Detective, where you can look at some of the images of stars that we have and try to find ones that have significant dust disks. And we've actually had citizen scientists who've been able to help, help be co-authors on papers um, by identifying these stars and the giant wise um, uh, telescope database. Um, I found it stressful because I'm such a scientist. I'm like, well, maybe, maybe not. I'm not really sure. This isn't my field. I'm a geologist. I don't, you know. But it was, it's really fun. So if we, the point is, let's make it authentic. Let's make sure it's not just, you know, oh, we're going to bring the public along, but it's not, it's not authentic. It has to be authentic, um, and I think it should be built into everything that we do, basically. Ellen, thanks for joining us this afternoon. That was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, and next up, a session produced by our underwriter, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Bonjour tout le monde. Hello from the children of planet Earth. fully grasp how far and how fast we have come. Our 
progress can be measured not only by the extent of our knowledge, but by increasing awareness of all that remains to be discovered. In the 21st century, humans will again leave their home planet for voyages of discovery and exploration. What we find out up there helps us live better lives down here. We'll make steady progress, one mission, one voyage, one landing at a time. Will we respond to the changes of our time with fear? Or will we face the future with confidence in who we are and what we stand for and the incredible things that we can do together? Please welcome to the stage Kirk Bresnicker, Chief Architect and Fellow of Hewlett Packard Labs. We need a revolution in computing. We need to analyze all of our information, all at once, like never before. The era when a subset, a sample, a partial solution worked is over. This is historic. This is revolutionary. And it's here, and it works. We call it memory-driven computing. It will allow us to put our entire species worth of data together and analyze it in real time. Imagine right now looking through 40,000 DVDs or 160 million books for just one image or one phrase and finding it instantly. But now think beyond that simple search. Think complex real world problems. Think health care, think industry. Think getting to Mars. What we're here to announce today is a working prototype, memory-driven computing now. 56 years ago, President Kennedy issued his famous moonshot address to Congress. And eight years later, Armstrong and Aldrin were touching down on the surface of the moon with the aid of computation no more powerful than a pocket calculator. We've improved a lot since then, this device would have been a supercomputer beyond the dreams of those initial computer sci uh, rocket scientists. But when we're thinking about exploring our next frontiers, our excitement must be tempered with reality. While computing has improved enormously since the moon landing, the fundamental architecture underlying it hasn't really changed all that much in 60 years. And that is quickly becoming the problem. As a computer engineer and a researcher, this is what keeps me up at night. The idea that our current technologies won't be able to deliver on our expectations for the future. How can this be happening? You're wondering, what's the problem? Well, blame it on the data. More data has been created in the last two years than in the prior history of our species. And yet less than 1% of that data is ever analyzed. By the year 2020, our digital universe will contain nearly as many bits of information as there are stars in the universe, with at least 20 billion mobile devices and a trillion applications creating and transmitting information. We'll have smart cars, smart factories, smart homes, even smart bodies. As a species, we will create a staggering amount of information every day. And the question is, what are we going to do with it all? Before we can answer that question, it's important to understand our current limitations and why we're pressing up against them now after 60 years of great progress. Starting in the 1950s, in business and in science, we began the, to automate the dreary process of number crunching. Thinking of a business doing payroll at the end of the month or closing the books at the end of the quarter. Computing made this hand to pencil to ledger process faster, more efficient, automatic, accurate and reliable. Sometimes it took a few days or weeks. Then think of the 90s and the web and dial up brought the world to your desktop. Ten years later and it was in your pocket. 
the amount of data we created grew exponentially, and our appetite for real-time, always-on information grew to match. In college, my friends and I used to waste whole evenings arguing about misremembered trivia. And now, um, I'm sorry, Joan Collins was in the original Star Trek, <laughs> episode 28, season one, sitting on the edge of forever, look it up. <laughs> that 24 by seven access stretched our networks and infrastructure to new limits. So we pulled out all the stops to scale. We consolidated, we moved to the cloud, we eked out those last nanometers of transistor performance and efficiency. Now we're on the cusp of a new era, driven by the Internet of Things and what we call the Intelligent Edge. In this new era of smart everything, we will demand much more from our computing systems. We will expect them to process and learn from zettabytes of sensor data and take action immediately. Speed, accuracy, reliability, security will be mission critical. A milliseconds delay or a minor miscalculation could genuinely mean the difference between life and death. But the fact is, right now, the incremental improvements we are seeing in our computing power will not meet the needs, the exponential demands of our future challenges. We need memory-driven computing. The mission to Mars is a perfect way to illustrate the magnitude of this problem. At 20 light minutes away, Mars is too far to rely on communications from Earth for real-time support. Where ground control once helped guide Armstrong and Aldrin to the moon, the Mars missions and crew will be guided by a computer capable of performing extraordinary tasks. Monitoring onboard systems the way a smart city would monitor itself, anticipating and addressing problems before they threaten the mission tracking the minute-by-minute -minute changes in astronaut health, monitoring vitals, and personalizing treatment to fit the exact need in the exact moment. Coordinating every terrestrial, deep space, Martian orbital, and rover sensor available so crew and craft can react to changing conditions in real time. And perhaps most importantly, combining, integrating these data sets to find those hidden correlations that can keep a mission and a crew alive. In short, the Mars spacecraft will need to be a smart city, an intelligent power grid, and an autonomous vehicle fleet all at once. And it will need to be controlled by a computer vastly more powerful than anything we've put into space. But there is the rub. Right now, existing technology, we'd need a massive data center attached to a nuclear power plant to achieve this computing power that a Mars mission will demand. What we've got today is just too big, too heavy, too slow, too inflexible, and too power hungry. We need 21st century computing to solve 21st century problems. We need memory-driven computing. At Hewlett Packard Enterprise, we've spent the last three years developing exactly that. In 2014, we announced and unveiled the largest and most complex research project in our company's history, with the goal of creating an entirely new kind of computer, one that isn't constrained by traditional trade-offs, one that eliminates performance bottlenecks, one that throws off 60 years of convention and compromise. We call it the Machine Research Project, and its mission to deliver the world's first memory-driven computing architecture. It's more than an idea. It is the way that the world will work. Without getting into too many technical details, as much as 90% of the work a computer does today, wasted time, wasted energy. And the more, we try and, more information we try and process, the slower the system gets, and the more energy it consumes. A huge amount of science and computer engineering has gone into working around these problems. It's time for a change. If you're familiar with Moore's Law, you'll know that we, till now, could always count on the chips getting better year over year. But that physics and that era is over. For 60 years, we focused on a tiny bit of data running through a faster and faster calculator. With memory-driven computing, we end the workarounds by inverting that problem. 
Last November, we turned on the world's first memory-driven computing prototype. In those following six months, we scaled it up 20-fold. Today, we're announcing that Hewlett Packard Enterprise has created what we believe is the largest single memory system computer the world has ever seen. 160 terabytes of data, data in memory. No computer on Earth can manipulate that much data in a single place at once. And this is just our prototype. We're engineering memory-driven computing systems with up to 4,096 yottabytes of data, more than 250,000 times the size of our digital universe today. So why is this important? When we can begin to analyze that much data at once, we will discover correlations we never could have conceived of before. And that ability will open up entirely new frontiers of intellectual discovery. The implications for an endeavor like the Mars mission are huge. It means we can shrink the time to solve complex problems from days to seconds, delivering real-time intelligence at the very edge of exploration. It means we can consolidate a massive data center to go anywhere computing is needed. Now think about that mission to Mars as a metaphor for life here on Earth. In a world where everything is connected and everything computes, our cars, our homes, our factories, even our bodies, we're going to need to take that computing power with us everywhere we go. And we're going to want to discover those correlations never before possible. To do that, we're going to need memory-driven computing. This is our mission at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, to enable a world where everything computes, to bring real-time intelligence to every corner of the Earth and beyond, and to help our world harness that intelligence to answer our toughest questions, tackle our hardest challenges, and help us understand the worlds better around us. Memory-driven computing will benefit us, our children and their children. It is a new world. Welcome. Thank you. For the tools of the task, please welcome Chris Carberry, CEO and co-founder of Explore Mars, Inc., Dr. Robert Zubrin, founder and president of the Mars Society, and Mary Lynn Dittmar, executive director for the Coalition for Deep Space Exploration. Here to lead the conversation, please welcome the Atlantic's Alexis Madrigal. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. You guys can take your seats. Now we get to get into some of the specifics, some of the fun things about exploring uh, our solar system. We have three distinguished experts with overlapping but independent expertise uh, around deep space exploration, in particular uh, Mars. Um, I just want to know how many doubters we have in the room. How many people think that we're, we're going to land humans on Mars in their lifetime? So pretty much everybody believes we're going to get there at some point. It's just a matter of when, um, and we're going we're gonna to get into that. Um, Let's start with the basics, uh, and you know, maybe Chris or anybody can take this one, actually. I mean, why Mars? Why, why the emphasis on Mars? Well, from my perspective, <clears throat> yeah, and Robert and Mary Lynn will go into this also. It's all closest place we can send humans. We're going to learn some of the big questions like, is there life in the solar system other pla another place other than Earth? It's also the place we can send humans where we can actually live off the land, to use ISRU and use the, utilize the water and the atmosphere. So there's a lot going for it that other, we can't go to other places or the moon doesn't actually have, at least in the quantity that Mars has. Plus, I think there's no other destination we have right now that's captured the imagination. Everything is Mars these days. There's tremendous support for Mars, more than we've ever seen. And I think there really is a precedence for sending humans to Mars, you know, in the next, you know, one to two decades. Yeah. And you were saying backstage that when you went into congressional offices in the 1990s, people rolled their eyes at you, and now people are interested. Yeah, it's, it literally is night and day. When back in the 90s, when we were visiting congressional offices, 
literally. They were rolling their eyes. They were looking at you as they were wearing Vulcan ears. <laughs> you know, and right at the time... To be fair, you actually wear those. I, I was, was not was, wearing them. Yeah. I was wearing my, <laughs> uh, my uh, Klingon outfit, but not my Vulcan ears. Uh, no, but, you know, at the time, NASA wasn't even able to talk about sending humans to Mars. They r literally were not allowed to actually talk about it. But now we go in, even places where when I go into congressional offices, you look at the procurement numbers for their district, I will literally look at it and I'll see a zero. There aren't too many congressional districts with a zero for NASA funding, but even some of those where you think you're going to go in and find absolutely no support, you know, we're shocked. We go in, you find the most enthusiastic people are just gung-ho because it's not just, a lot of people say it's based on if there's a NASA district, a NASA facility in their district. That's not even the case anymore. I think there's genuine passion right now all across the country to actually achieve this. And so we just need to really lean forward. We have an opportunity right now to get this done, but we can't be timid. We have to find a way of getting humans on the surface of the, on the surface of the planet by the early 30s, 2030s. Um, Bob, this has been one of your things you've wanted to do for decades. You've wanted to land people on Mars. And you've kind of at times made more cultural arguments about why we need to do this kind of exploration and why specifically Mars. Can you just, you know, in one minute, gloss those uh, for, the, for the audience? Well, I mean, well, just first to reinforce that, Mars is where the science is. Mars is where the challenge is. Mars is where the future is. And uh, look, from a technological point of view, we're much closer to being able to send humans to Mars today than we were to being able to send men to the moon in 1961. And we were there eight years later. If we had an actual commitment to send humans to Mars, which we do not. What we have right now is just drift. It is not a program. But if we had a real commitment, we could be on Mars within eight years. And to say that we can't is to say that we have become less than the kind of people that we used to be, which is something that this country cannot afford. Yeah. But what do you make of the end of the Apollo program so soon after having landed you know, humans on, on the moon? Well, that was a historical mistake. Uh, it was as if Ferdinand and Isabella had welcomed Columbus back from the New World and said, oh, so what? Burn the fleet. So history <laughs> went off the rail, and we have never restarted it. We've never had the complete conjunction of adequate presidential leadership, congressional support, and NASA leadership all at the same time that we had in the 60s. That's what we need. We need a president who can rally such support, which uh, maybe we don't, um, and w a Congress that's willing to follow and deliver, and a NASA that is willing to think. I mean, you take this thing we heard today about a lunar orbit space station. If anybody was told, you're the manager of Humans to Mars program, here's your budget, let's see you get to Mars, the idea of spending part of it on a lunar orbiting space station wouldn't cross their mind. It is not needed to go to Mars, it's not needed to go to the moon. It is just a project to be done. Right now, NASA is not spending money to do things, it is doing things to spend money, and that needs to be corrected. The way we got to the moon was not by finding something to do for a random set of constituently supported programs. Rather, the way it happened was we had a president who set a goal and a timeline within his own time, and then from that goal came a plan, from that plan came a set of vehicles, from that set of vehicles came a variety of technology development programs needed to create those vehicles. We didn't go to m the moon to give our lunar excursion module lobby something to do, okay? We had lunar excursion modules because we had a moon program. The robotic Mars program is successful because it is mission-driven, okay? We developed airbags so we could land rovers on Mars. We didn't land rovers on Mars in order to have employment for airbags, okay? Right. And right. Th so we need leadership. We need leadership at the top of the government and at the top of NASA, and we don't have it right now. Um, Marilyn, I want to ask you about, just so we get, make sure everyone is on the same page. What is the, as you see it, the sort of base case? Like, let's say nothing tremendously different happens over the next few years. Are we on a path to actually get humans on Mars in the early 2030s? Um, and what might inflect that path and be able to push it up or back in time? Whether or not we're on a path to get to get people on Mars in the early 2030s depends on who we is. Um, the, the, the we um, that is NASA has a forward plan 
Bob may not like it, but there is a forward plan. Um, it is certainly a plan that's in development. It's a plan that's evolving. It is not a plan that's called in, carved in stone. It's a plan that, to defend NASA for a minute, they have to operate under a tremendous number of constraints. Um, and those constraints involve a broad constituency or set of constituencies, some of whom are political, some of whom are international, some of whom are industry, some of whom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, Trying to operate within those constraints is, is a difficult task. Um, there's not sufficient funding um, to be able to go there and hit the mark as quickly or as directly as we would like to have. I mean, I'm just sort of say that directly. I'm not speaking for NASA at this point. Let me be clear. Speaking for me, um, there's, not, there's not sufficient funding to be able to do that. The, there's technology development that still needs to occur in order to be able to go to Mars, and there are some cases, um, Ellen referred, Ellen Stefan referred to some of them, which are relatively short term, like an ecosystem that will actually allow us to go into deep space, ecosystem environmental life support, um, basically allow us to go into space and stay there for a long period of time. We still don't have one. Um, we have one, but it has a really high maintenance requirement, and you can't have that over time. Um, it needs to be replenished. Can't have that over time. If we're operating a whole lot of miles away from Earth, it's not like we're going to send oxygen ships out every now and then to replenish the ecosystem because it's not working properly. Um, it would really be good to have nuclear thermal propulsion um, to be able to go to Mars. It's not an absolute necessity, but it'd be a lovely thing to be able to have. Um, and there's other technologies that I think need to be developed. So to echo a little bit about what Bob said, um, the focus, which is going to have to be, it's politically driven Okay, in this country. In other words, the country doesn't undertake they don't undertake um, programs of any kind, any initiative, anywhere, okay, unless there's appropriate political support. NASA has very strong um, bipartisan support and has had that for a long time, but the fact of the matter is that compared to other national priorities, space simply hasn't been that high on the list. Yeah. You know, recently signed by President Trump was the NASA Transition Authorization Act, um, mentions Mars and Mars programs 28 times. Um, did that change anything? Did that do anything? No, it was, I mean, it was a slight improvement on Obama's NASA budget. It was not a remarkable change. Uh, and if you do think that nuclear thermal propulsion is vital to get humans to Mars, then you ought to have a nuclear thermal propulsion development program, which they do not. Okay. The, but also, I mean, look, I, I once again have to come back to this. There is not a plan. There is random activity. If a lunar orbiting space station was a vital step on the way to Mars, how come it didn't figure into any of Von Braun's plans in the 90-day report, into Mars Direct, into the design reference mission, into the, the vision for space exploration? Uh, it didn't because it isn't needed. Well, it is just let me ask something. You what the to, it's a boondoggle. You don't think it has anything to do with the speed of carrying out missions or any of the... What are, what are the backers of, of this? Do people know what, what we're talking about here? No. I'm going to come to you. Oh, okay. Um, so NASA rolled out a plan at, uh, I don't know, a couple of months ago now, maybe a month ago, don't remember. Um, basically, for the next several steps in development um, on what was called the Journey to Mars, um, the, so completion of SLS, which is the, the big uh, rocket, um, and Orion, and then the next step after that is for a cislunar hab, which they're now calling the Deep Space Gateway, um, which has evolved somewhat in its design and focus. And the idea of that is to get that out into lunar orbit um, and then to use it as a test bed um, for humans and along, basically being out in deep space for a long period of time, also other biological systems, um, also probably some technology development. And the other thing that, that NASA is envisioning is that international partners can play a role in that. One of the things that we haven't really talked about a lot today, but I do want to emphasize is that pretty much everyone um, has agreed numerous studies from the National Academies, NASA's work, a lot of other people have agreed that basically moving forward to Mars is an international prospect. There's, there are some people who disagree with that, okay, but the, the position of the United States, as exemplified in the Transition Act that you just mentioned, is that the, us going to Mars is basically going to be done the, in partnership, and it's going to be in partnership with international partners as well as in partnership with industry partners. So the idea, part of the idea of the Deep Space Gateway is that that's an opportunity, essentially, for international partners, for industry partners, to be able to contribute to development as well as to make use of that um, as they see fit. Chris, I want to come to you because I think at least some of the excitement around Mars is because of Elon Musk and Bezos um, sort of doing things in space that people weren't doing before. Um, 
How do you look at their at their plans? I mean, we've seen Mars by 2025 and and things of that nature. What do you what do you think? I think it's very exciting. I don't necessarily. I think they, a lot of them are aspirational. SpaceX and um, and Blue Origin are doing remarkable things. Do I think you know SpaceX is going to land uh, humans on Mars by 2025? I don't think so. You know, I, I think Elon's also said he doesn't have the money to do it, and I think you know he's created a very large plan. It seems, but I think he's excited the public, and I think in the end it's going to take a combination of efforts. It's not going to just be SpaceX, not going to just be NASA and the other players. I think it's going to take the combined efforts, finding the right balance of all these capabilities. I think there's a lot of stuff being developed right now, and so one thing. I agree with Robert on, we do need to make some decisions. We need to kind of have a clear path, you know, from here to Mars. I don't necessarily agree with Robert on every, everything, but a lot of very key decisions need to be made very soon to show that we are on this path to get to Mars. And that includes SpaceX and Blue Origin and Boeing, Lockheed, Aerojet, Orbital ATK, and finding the right balance. Because it's not just about finding the most efficient, the cheapest mission you can create, because that might actually not be the most politically realistic. You know, I like coming at it from here. You know, just because you have, you could do this about as efficiently as possible, it's not necessarily going to have the political support you need to sustain it. You know, when Robert was talking about, you know, like, for instance, when JFK made his speech and then we went to the moon in eight years, it was a different, different era. I think one of the traps we get into in the space community is we're waiting along, waiting along for the magical Kennedy-like speech, which isn't going to be coming. I think something, something that uh, matches the era we're in might come. You know, there are a lot of variables that we cannot replicate from the 1960s, but in some ways, I like think that's... the Cold War, for example. Well, the Cold War, yeah. yeah, and there was one reason for going to the moon, at least politically, to beat the Soviets to the moon. We did that, and then we had no justification for staying. It was not a sustainable program. Right now, even though we're not as focused as maybe we should be, I agree with that 100%, I think we actually have a stronger case to create a sustainable program. We have a lot more reasons for going to Mars. Sometimes it gets a little bit confusing because there are so many good reasons. It's not as easy to articulate as we're going to beat the Soviet Union, but we need to articulate that. So if we can get the right path going, I think we can actually do a much better job at creating a sustainable program where we'll actually go to Mars and we'll stay. Yeah. Okay. Look, what there's an infinite number of alternative activities one can say they need to do before they go to Mars. Last year, it was to put a 500-ton rock in lunar orbit. Okay, that was supposedly a key step on the way to Mars. It had nothing to do with it. It was just something that had certain constituency support. The the we. It really needs to be understood. There needs to be leadership. Now, SpaceX has a better chance of sending humans to Mars than NASA does now, despite the fact that it's got uh, one to two orders of magnitude lower resources, because the person leading SpaceX actually wants to go to Mars. Now, I'm an astronautical engineer. I wrote a detailed critique of uh, Musk's plan. Um, there's a lot of interesting ideas in it. I think it needs to be disciplined uh, away from the gigantic scale of it, and if it is, I think it could work, and I think he could put humans on Mars by the end of the 2020s, um, although that's by no means certain. There's all sorts of things that can get in the way of that. But where there's a will, there's a way. Where there is not a will, there is not a way. Let's talk about some of the challenges, the individual technical challenges uh, to overcome. Um, maybe let's start with just how we're going to get there. You mentioned uh, nuclear thermal propulsion. How long with the sort of current generation of technology would it take us to get to Mars? And what do you think that time needs to be cut down to to make it realistic to have a continuing program on Mars? Well, the current generation, I'm not quite sure how to answer the question, because the current generation of launch vehicles um, to get to Mars, basically, we would have to launch a whole lot of stuff into um, Earth orbit, assemble it, and then start pushing it to Mars. The idea of, um, you, I mean, or take little tiny bits of time, yeah. um, over a long period of time. Um, the idea of the um, space launch system is that it can land much, much, much larger payloads. Um, and so that's, that was its conception, um, the idea that you would be able to take large payloads into deep space. Um, I do think there's one thing that we miss a lot, though, and that is that a lot of the discussion about getting to Mars is about the how to get to Mars. There's really not enough discussion, in my view, about what happens when you get to Mars. So getting to Mars is like one 
Certainly it's a large part of the equation, but I would argue that there's a great many resources, both in industry and in government, that are being put in to develop that right now. There are also some um, resources that are being put into what you're actually going to do on the surface. Um, but surviving on the surface, if you can't survive on the surface, then why the heck are you going in the first place? So we use um, the International Space Station right now as a test bed for a lot of those technologies um, mentioned before uh, the environmental control system. But also, we want to be able to not have to haul our food with us all the time, right? So we want to be able to grow crops. How many of you have watched The Martian? Okay, Mark Watney, okay, he did it with potatoes and some very interesting biological matter, okay, <laughs> which allowed him to be able to sort of grow potatoes. But right now on the space station, for example, there are a number of experiments that have fallen under the name veggie, okay, which are really about growing vegetables in space, okay? And it's harder than it sounds if you think about it for a minute and tell the story and then sort of allow you to move on. But, but if you think about it for a minute, how many of you have bought um, vegetables and basically stuck them in a bag in order to be able to ripen them. Anybody ever done that? Tomatoes, you get some green tomatoes, you stick them in a bag, they ripen faster. Do you know why? There's a gas that they emit okay, as they're ripening, and basically the presence of that gas actually facilitates additional ripening. And so when you stick them in a bag, what you're basically doing is putting them in an enclosed environment okay, so that they basically start to ripen faster. What is the space station? A bag. An enclosed environment, okay? And so, and the situation, the place in which they actually grow itself is enclosed. So you have a problem. So you have to be able to remove some of that gas. So there's actually been a technology that's been developed to be able to pull that gas out, which is now being used on Earth, okay, to be able to sort of extract gases in environments where you don't want them. Those kinds of things we only learn by doing. And that's really critical, okay, for us to be able to figure out how it is that we're going to survive on Mars. Let's talk about landing on Mars. We'll go the middle step. You took the end. So let's, uh, let's talk about actually landing on, on Mars. Uh, Bob, do you think there, what would be your preferred plan? Uh, well, uh, since I'm an old fashioned engineer and I started my aerospace career working in the same Martin Marietta group that did the Viking landing on Mars, my uh, preferred route would be parachutes and retro rockets to soft land. And that, by the way, was done in 1976 when we had computers that were one millionth as good as those that are in the pocket of every person in this room. Okay, so the idea that we need new revolutionary computers to land on Mars is uh, incredible. Now, of course, Musk has just demonstrated something that two years ago I would have thought was science fiction, or three years ago anyway, which was supersonic retro propulsion. He's now doing it routinely to land his boosters on Earth. You could also do that on Mars, and that, in fact, is part of his approach. And it's now credible for exactly that reason. But, you know, a few years ago, you had NASA people saying, oh, we can't send humans to Mars because it would require parachutes much bigger than any developed before. Now, hello, when we sent humans to the moon, we mastered technical challenges a lot harder than building bigger parachutes. Okay, I mean, this is crazy. This is looking for excuses. Okay, this is, this is not a reason why we can't go to Mars. This is a certain technical challenge that can be readily addressed. A and, you know, I mean, one of the things we should be doing in this next decade is shooting 30 ton payloads to Mars using a cryogenic upper stage on SLS or Falcon Heavies and, uh, uh, and landing them on Mars, uh, uh, major payloads, not putting a space station in lunar orbit so we can examine the effects of solar flares on human physiology, which is, as far as I'm concerned, is unethical medical research. It's mm -hmm. not a space program. <clears throat> Yeah, we had a, um, recently we released a report called the Mars Achievability and Sustainability Report, which actually, we had a workshop, every year we have a workshop bringing together stakeholders, Mars architects, scientists, et cetera, about 50 or 60 people, and this year we released, it's about 90 page report, looking at actually these issues, the tall pole issues, things like entry, descent, landing, ECLIS, uh, you know, life support, et cetera, ISRU, and uh, surface power. And so we wanted to make sure to really address these issues because there has been so much focus and kind of obsession over which launch vehicle we're going to use and other ones that get a lot of press. But uh, th this is a good question because there are a lot of these technologies, you know, that we can manage, but we have to start working on right now. This is why it's so important that we make the decisions because it's a lot more than making a decision. We actually have to start on these capabilities. You know, even I, I'm not an I'm 
the only one without technical background here. I'm a p political guy, but I know for a fact in all these discussions, for instance, entry, descent, and landing, you know, whether it's using Robert's approach or something else, is an enormous challenge, and we have to start figuring it out. The biggest thing we've landed on Mars is the Curiosity rover, and we'll probably need something at least 20, 20 times as big as that. Yeah, I'm also, you know, last sort of individual technology I want to talk about is, uh, or sort of, it's, it's more of just the general challenge of the, this communication gap as the astronauts, presumed astronauts, would get uh, closer and closer to Mars. Um, how do you think that will play out? Like what, because it's not really so much an individual technology as much as it is like you need to develop a system of working that makes sense within this incredibly bizarre environment with a massive communication delay. So really going back very early in my career, um, we were looking at latencies in communication. Latency is just the time that it takes between when you issue a transmission and when it gets to wherever you're going and then where it's going and then basically the time coming back. So um, round trip latency is just basically how much time it takes to get there and come back. Mars is about 40 minutes. Um, we looked at a lot of ways to sort of fill in the gap by simulating um, activities. So for example, if you had a set of procedures that you were going to execute in a certain period of time, my background's in space operations, um, if you had a period of um, procedures that you were going to execute, when you send the commands, or basically you know that somebody's supposed to be going doing that, okay, you can simulate that okay, on Earth, and so you have some sense about where they should be. Um, meanwhile, the folks up there could simulate things going back. This is really unwieldy, and there's a whole lot of ways that it can go wrong. Um, so one thing that's going to have to happen is that over time, and, and certainly NASA's aware of this and other industry partners are aware of this, um, we're going to have to develop ways of operating that just have a whole heck of a lot more autonomy. And perhaps those ways of operating um, than we have right now in station. And there have been a couple of uh, exercises of that. And then certainly there's the moon where there was a slight latency, very slight compared to Mars. Um, so you'd have to operate a lot more autonomously. A couple of things that may help with that are the develop of more um, capable robotic help. Okay, so um, robotic help that's available that has some additional AI built in it relative to what we're talking about right now, okay, will be really helpful with regard to doing that. But the other thing does have to do with improving our communications capabilities. Um, right now, there's a deep space network that is the primary pipe by which we basically communicate with craft that are going out into deep space. It's heavily subscribed. One could argue oversubscribed. Um, so, and it doesn't manage, it doesn't help with the latency issue very much. There's work that's being done in optical communications, which is essentially laser, laser communications communications. Um, and so, but what most people think we're half going to do is essentially string a series of communication nodes um, out further than we are right now. That may be work that can be done um, in deep, deep, deep uh, lunar orbit, and then as well as the sort of Lagrangian points as you move on. Um, there's a number of different architectures for addressing it, but the bottom line for me is that human explorers through history have basically operate it relatively autonomously. They're not always in touch with home. Um, that's why crew training and crew selection is really important. It's why developing your capabilities is really important. It's why making sure that you've ensured the opportunity for people to actually be able to thrive and survive in space is very important. Um, and we're going to have to put a lot of time and effort into being able to do that because once you get out there, bottom line, those folks are going to be on their own. Yeah, but and that is the point. The human side... Get your questions ready, only because after this answer, we're going to take two audience questions. All right. The crew's going to have with them a computer vastly better than anything NASA has on Earth, namely their brains, okay? And as far as robots and such, we're on the point right now of deploying self-driving cars that can negotiate the traffic in New York City and Los Angeles. There's a lot less traffic on Mars. Okay? <laughs> so really, we do not need to command either the crew or their robotic assistants like marionettes. They will be able to handle themselves. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yeah, hi, Frank Slazer with the Aerospace Industries Association. I'll ask an unpopular question probably, uh, but one I think that needs some thought. Uh, Mars is a great place to go. Looking forward to the first humans on Mars. A lot of people talk about Mars colonies and making permanent settlements there. Last time I looked, colonies require some form of trade to pay for them, and gold, potatoes, tobacco, name your, name your commodity. I don't think that we know of anything coming back from Mars that's going to make an economic proposition of settling it. Uh, and if you want to save the, United, uh, the uh, human race by having a multi-planet species, wouldn't the moon be much better? What's the long-term case for mass uh, colonization of Mars. I'd like to answer this. Okay. <laughs> I'm shocked uh, by that, Bob. Yeah, it, <laughs> okay, first of all, you need to understand there's no such thing as a natural resource. 
There's only natural raw materials. Land on Earth was not a resource until we invented agriculture. Oil was not a resource until we developed petroleum drilling, refining, and machines that could use the product. Uranium, not a resource until we developed nuclear power. It is people who are resourceful. Okay. There are no resources on Mars now. There will be once there are resourceful people there. Now, to answer the question in, in, in more specifically, okay, the first several... 30 issues, seconds. Okay. <laughs> An inventor's colony. On Mars, you're going to have a group of, of technologically adept people in a frontier environment where they're free to innovate and forced to innovate, and they're going to innovate, and their inventions that they do to manage them, their situation on Mars will be licensable on Earth. That's what we're going to export from Mars. We're going to export inventions. Good answer. All right. That last question. Is everyone scared? <laughs> Let me ask my last question then. Um, back when I first started reporting on these things, um, and people had the old machines versus humans debate about what what we should be paying to send uh, into the solar system, you know, artificial intelligence was sort of in one of its winters, and it wasn't considered to be. Um, you know, we, people were not imagining that we would have the technologies even that we have right now uh, in self-driving cars. So looking out on the timelines that we're talking here, 15, 20 years, um, do, you, do we still think we'll want to send humans in 10 years or 15 years? Or will there be other things we can send that have more of our capabilities? Have more capabilities? Have more of our capabilities. Have more of our capabilities. Yeah, we could send some things that have more of our capabilities, but let me just talk about human beings for a minute. When we talk about AI, what we're really talking about is the ability to do computation at very, very high rates of speed, using a tremendous amount of data that then leads the machine to be able to help the human, or it leads the machine itself to come to certain conclusions as a result of that rationality. No question, but that capability is greatly advancing. No question at all. However, human beings make use of information that comes in in ways that we are completely unconscious of. We make use of information that comes in through our fingertips. We make use of information that comes in through our feet. We make use of information that comes in through our hearing, through touch of our hair, through what we're seeing, through language, through all kinds of... There is yet no mechanism. There's very early, and I mean early, rudimentary work, okay, on processing via a whole lot of different sensory channels information into an AI. Until we're able to do that and then gift the AI with the capability to be in a novel environment, look around that environment, see some outcreeping rock, think, huh, what is that? Okay, basically go up to it and start hypothesizing at a tremendous rate of speed, okay, about what it might be to even recognize that it's a novel thing that it needs to be paying attention to. Okay, we are nowhere near that. Sorry, guys, with regard to AI. We may get there, okay, but we are nowhere near that. There's a lot of other arguments about why he would send human beings out there, but in terms of the sheer science, capability for knowledge, capability for discovery, and capability for actually transforming ourselves, which will happen once we start going out there, there is no comparison to human beings. Let's end it on the pro-humans note. Thank you very much. <laughs> and now, with a view from the Hill, please welcome the chairman of the Senate Commerce Subcommittee on Space, Science, and Competitiveness, Senator Ted Cruz. And please welcome back Ross Anderson. Senator Cruz, thank you for being with us on a, uh, a busy week. Um, I want to talk about space. Not much is happening. No. <laughs> um, I want to talk about space uh, for a long time, but before that, do that, I feel compelled to ask you. Um, a number of your uh, Republican colleagues in the Senate have uh, said they were disturbed by the revelation um, that uh, President Trump may have shared classified info mm -hmm. with Russian officials in the Oval Office. Do you share their concerns? Well, it, it's unquestionably important that we protect sources and methods uh, of intelligence gathering. Uh, that is vital for protecting the safety and even the lives of the brave men and women in our intelligence community that, that are helping us keep our nation safe. Uh, it, it's vital for protecting uh, the safety of the intelligence community of our allies. And uh, that being said, I want to understand the facts and circumstances of what was communicated. Um, I, I think it's a mistake to leap to conclusions based on press reports, based on anonymous sources. Uh, and, and so I look forward uh, to learning the facts and details and context uh, in a classified setting, to understanding exactly what was communicated and, and what the consequences were of that communication. 
Is there a certain level of communication or classification that you would know in advance would be inappropriate? Uh, it depends very much on substance. The substance matters. Um, we've seen reporting based on anonymous sourcing that suggests significant negative consequences. <laughs> if, if that's accurate, that's concerning. But, but I don't want to leap to conclusions without actually knowing the facts. That's, that's a, a bit of a radical view here in Washington. Uh, but but, but, but I, think, I think it's the right way to approach the issue. Sure. Let's talk about space. All right. Um, uh, anyone who's familiar with your politics knows that you have strong views about uh, what the private sector ought to be pursuing and what is a public good that we all should be sort of chipping in on. Why does space exploration belong in that second category? Well, space exploration has been an issue that has energized and excited generations of Americans. Uh, America has led the world in space. It has produced incredible scientific discoveries. It has produced thousands upon thousands of jobs, billions of, and billions in revenue. And, and, and I think it's critical that, that, that America continues to lead in space, uh, that, that we restore our unquestioned leadership in exploring uh, our own solar system and beyond. And, and, you know, one of the things that's encouraging, I, I think there's a bipartisan commitment to America's leadership in space. And there are not many issues today on which there is a bipartisan commitment, but that, that's one. And, and I think that's very good for those of us who care about continuing to explore space. When you said restore, um, that suggested to me that there had been a drop-off. What what are the sort of symptoms of that drop-off as you see it? Well, <laughs> uh, look, rather than look, look backwards, I want to look forwards, sure. which is how do we ensure a strong and stable footing uh, for space exploration and for NASA going forward? You know, in the last three years, um, <laughs> we've been able to pass two major pieces of legislation through the Senate, uh, both coming out of the committee I chair, the Science and Space Subcommittee, uh, the first was in 2015 was the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act, uh, which, which sought to protect property rights in space, which extended the regulatory moratorium uh, on space so that people will invest in space, which established that if a private company goes to an asteroid and, and mines the asteroid, that, that that private company, that private citizen owns whatever it, it, it mines and brings back to Earth. Um, that was bipartisan legislation. We passed it through both houses of Congress. President Obama signed it into law. And then earlier this year, the NASA authorization bill, uh, that likewise was bipartisan legislation. It, the first bill, the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act, extended the space station until 2024. The NASA authorization directed NASA to study an additional four years beyond that so that we can get the maximum use possible out of the space station. Mm -hmm. uh, we've obviously invested billions and billions of dollars in it. We want to get every bit of use that, that is scientifically and technically feasible. Uh, that bill passed both houses of Congress in a bipartisan manner, and, and President Trump signed it into law. And, and, and I'll say it, it is remarkable and it should be encouraging uh, for everyone interested in space that, that in an intensely partisan environment where you have Republicans and Democrats at each other's throats on almost everything, that we've been able to see legislation, two different pieces of legislation that I authored, signed into law, one by Barack Obama and one by Donald Trump. Uh, th that is, is, I think, a really meaningful commitment to space exploration and to expanding America's leadership there. I, I think America should be the unquestioned leader to, in space, and that's going to take a, a bipartisan commitment and leadership coming from Congress. Uh, I know you have a, a strong view of what NASA's core mission uh, should be. Can you give me a sense for what that emphasizes and what it sort of leaves out? Um, I think NASA's core mission is space exploration. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what NASA was created to do. Um, you, know, you know, frankly, I, I don't think you can get any better than, than, than Star Trek. Uh, <laughs> you know, to boldly go where no man has gone before. Mm. Uh, you know, I personally still hear James Tiberius Kirk saying that. Um, listen, the, 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 there are, are millions and millions of little boys and little girls who've looked to the stars and, and have been inspired. Uh, what's out there? Is there life out there? 
Are there other civilizations? What, what, what is up in the sky? And, you know, much as in the 1960s, John F. Kennedy inspired a nation by declaring that America would go to the moon and an American would walk on the moon within a decade. That was an audacious claim. And yet it inspired a nation and inspired the world and came to fruition. Uh, in my view, the next major milestone like that is going to Mars. Mm -hmm. And going to Mars is something that we codified in the NASA Authorization Act. And, and I think it's important to set big, bold goals to unify the scientific community, to unify the exploration efforts. Going to Mars is not going to be easy. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, for a minute minimize it. it. It wouldn't be easy, even if we sent Matt Damon, it wouldn't be easy. <laughs> but I think it's worth doing, and, and, and I think it helps unify and propel space exploration going forward. Should we understand that as being to the detriment of Earth science missions? I, no. It, it, science is critical, and, and you can't have NASA without vibrant science. Mm -hmm. NASA should be driven by science, but, but NASA's core mission there are a host of agencies that, that, that do scientific research, that have a scientific focus. Mm -hmm. That's not NASA's central mission. Space exploration, leading space exploration, is NASA's central mission. And, and I certainly am doing everything I can to, to encourage as many resources as possible, as much of NASA's leadership, to be focused on exploration. Suppose that uh, President Trump next week were to suspend the Constitution um, uh, only for the reason of putting you in charge of NASA for the next 15 years. Uh, wh what does the Senator Cruz NASA plan for the next 15 years look like? <laughs> well, l let me ignore the first part of the hypo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but listen, I think NASA is in a position to help direct and lead America's leadership in space. Um, one of the fabulous developments we've seen is the growth of the commercial space industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've seen it grow not in competition with NASA. Uh, you know, there used to be a vision that the only exploration that can happen has to come from NASA, from taxpayer authorized and funded activities. Uh, the challenge is, in a world of scarce, scarce resources, uh, it is unlikely that you're going to see Congress appropriate all the funds we need for space exploration if it was only from taxpayer funds. Commercial space has grown up now alongside NASA, and, and there is a, a good, harmonious relationship between the two, where we want to create an environment where there are incentives in the private sector to invest billions and billions of dollars to ensure America's continued leadership and to get leverage so that for every dollar of taxpayer funding, you have many multiples of that of private funding that is focused on developing space exploration. You know, I'd love to see us return to the moon. I'd love to see us go to Mars. I'd love to see us ultimately have habitations. Hmm. Uh, in space, the space station has shown in incredible, with incredible success, including keeping an astronaut uh, in space for over a year. We're making leaps and bounds forward. But we need to creep, keep creating the incentives so that the private sector will invest the billions. And I'll, I'll make a prediction right now. The first trillionaire hmm. will be made in space. Hmm. Will be the entrepreneur <laughs> who invests and makes discoveries in space that we cannot even envision. Right now we have billionaires. The prediction I'm making, the first trillionaire, will be in the space exploration world, and that is a wonderful incentive for a whole bunch of folks to invest and, and help us develop this, this, this new and, and great frontier. Uh, I want to talk about, you said something that, uh, that NASA and the private sector are, are no longer in competition. Um, I'm thinking about uh, the SLS, the Space Launch, space launch System, uh, which NASA, as you know, uh, has taken a bit of time uh, in developing. And, while that's been going on, Elon Musk's SpaceX has, right. uh, has built the Falcon Heavy and that looks like it's ready to test this year. Is that an argument for shifting that money over to Elon, the SLS money? I, look, I think we should continue to look for ways to enhance competition and drive down costs. And I think the private sector plays a, a, a big part. I've been to 
SpaceX's testing facilities in McGregor, Texas, uh, which, which are incredibly impressive. Uh, y you know, those of us who, who are liberal arts majors, you know, you know, are fond of the phrase, it's not rocket science. Mm -hmm. And well, <laughs> this is rocket science. Uh, and and, and it, is, it is so impressive what we're seeing. You know, we're seeing the private sector now able to have reusable rockets that take off and land. <laughs> Ten years ago, if we were sitting at a conference like this and I were to say we're going to have rockets that can take off and land, you would have said that that is batty. That can't happen. We all know that's not the way rockets work. That's the sort of innovation we need to see happening more and more, and, and, and I think the more we can incentivize it. And, you know, l let's take a minute to, to focus back on, on the NASA authorization bill. Hmm. So the efforts to pass that started probably a year and a half ago. And uh, I would say early last year. Uh, and at the time, uh, nobody knew who the next president was going to be. Uh, I can promise you, <laughs> at the time, I did not envision Donald Trump uh, would be our president. Mm. Um, <laughs> I'm going to leave that one where it is. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but what was clear, mm. if you look historically, changes in administrations have not been good for NASA. Uh, they have not been good for space exploration, whether Republican or Democrat. Changes in administration have brought enormous uncertainty into NASA. And you end up seeing new presidents come in canceling major programs. The cancellation of Constellation mm -hmm. cost thousands upon thousands of jobs, wasted billions of dollars. Are you saying we should never change the administration? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I didn't want to see that sort of uncertainty injected in NASA. And, and so the effort to pass NASA authorization, you know, it's been seven years since we've had a NASA authorization. 2010 was the last one. Hmm. The reason it was able to pass is, is starting on, in the Commerce Committee and in the Science and Space Committee, uh, I was working collaboratively and closely with Republicans and Democrats. Uh, Bill Nelson, the ranking member in the full committee, cares deeply about space, Democrat from Florida. Uh, he and I have worked together in a very collaborative manner to come together. The only way you're going to get it passed is to get buy-in. You had to get buy-in from other senators uh, in other states. For whatever reasons, there are states other than Texas that care about space exploration. I, 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 I can't understand why, but, but I'm told they have some equities in the issue as well. Um, we spent upwards of a year working and negotiating a bill that would get buy-in across Republicans, across the geographical diversity, across the ideological diversity, that would get the buy-in from the Democrats. And then we pre-conferenced with the House. We, we did, didn't think we would have time to have separate bills pass both houses and then go through conference. So we pre-conferenced, meeting with the key leaders in the House to ensure that their concerns were reflected in the bill. And, and that bill is the bill that was ultimately signed by President Trump just a few weeks ago. And, and that was designed to ensure stability and continuity, that whatever happened with a new administration, that NASA would remain stable, would remain growing, would remain in a position to ensure America's leadership in space. That, that, that bipartisan commitment, the fact that you had Democrats and Republicans in the Senate and the House committed that we're going to go to Mars, that, that America is going to lead the way, that it is going to be an American walking on the surface of Mars, and that NASA is going to lead the way in creating an environment to foster commercial space where the two can work in harmony, that is powerful and that's encouraging for the future. Talk to me about uh, your first space trillionaire. Um, uh, currently, the outer I, I, I don't know who it is, or, or, or else, uh, or, or um, else I could advise you all to invest. But uh, sure. Um, uh, and and by the way, Ross, f f feel free to become that person. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, how should we, how should we think about the outer space treaty? Um, as I understand it, it. it doesn't allow you to go and sort of mine helium three from the moon, yep. for instance, or platinum from asteroids. Uh, do you see? Uh, that treaty being amended sometime soon? Look, it's a great question. The Outer Space Treaty was, was adopted in 1967. Uh, this year is the 50-year anniversary for it. And, and in many ways, it's remarkable that, that at the height of the Cold War, 
that America and the Soviet Union were able to come together and, and, and reach agreement on that treaty. And, and, you know, the central focus of that treaty was preventing nuclear weapons in space. And, and that, that's a very good thing. None of us want to see nukes in space. Uh, but 50 years later, we're in a very different environment. We're in an environment where, you know, soon we are expecting the, the first private mission to the moon. Uh, done not with under government auspices, but under private investment. I mean, that's something in 1967 that, that no one could have envisioned. Uh, we've got the prospects of, of mining and eventually settlement, whether on the moon, mining on asteroids. Um, and, and I'll actually take this, this opportunity to, to, to break a little news, uh, which is next week, a week from today, uh, the Senate Science and Space Committee will be holding a hearing uh, on, on the space treaty mm -hmm. and on whether modifications and updates are called for. And we'll be listening and, and hearing testimony both from lawyers that have studied the issues and, and also from business leaders that want to expand commercial investment in space and considering how do we update and modernize the treaty to reflect the realities of the modern world. And I think mm -hmm. that, that, that that is a pressing question and one that, that I hope we will get bipartisan agreement on how to modernize it uh, to create the incentive for continued investment. Uh, outside of nuclear weapons, uh, what sorts of restrictions on private property rights on, uh, say, the moon do you favor? Like, could you imagine a day when, instead of looking up at a moon that's pockmarked by craters, we see a bunch of mines? Well, uh, look, I, I don't want to start by uh, making decisions before we hear testimony. Mm -hmm. and before we think through it, just like your opening question. I, <laughs> uh, yeah, look, both my parents were scientists. Mm -hmm. uh, both my parents were mathematicians and computer programmers. Uh, I believe that science uh, and space policy should be driven by, by facts and evidence. And one of the reasons why we were able to get bipartisan buy-in on two major pieces of legislation, one signed by Obama, one signed by Trump, is that the committee proceeds methodically listening to testimony in a collaborative way and reflecting the, the, the learning and what we hear. So when it comes to how to update the Outer Space Treaty, I think the first step is, is to listen to experts in the field, listen to people who are dealing with these constraints, and, and, and try to have it be the same sort of collaborative process that has worked so successfully in the past. Uh, th that, that's exactly how I'd like, to, like it to go in the future. Um, would you elevate uh, American leadership in space to a national security imperative? For instance, is it, I mean, uh, is it essential that we put the first boots on Mars uh, over, say, China, which is lately interested in doing the same? Whether it's national security or not, it, it is critical for national leadership. Uh, this is the United States of America. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe it's vital that America lead. Um, I think every American would be crestfallen to see another nation leading in space and to see America recede. Um, I, I, I think we are the indispensable nation. And our leadership now, we can work very cooperatively with other countries. You look at the, the International Space Station, where we work in, in harmony with other nations. Uh, but I think American leadership is vital uh, in, in, in that regard. One of the things that is completely unacceptable right now is we don't have the technology to take our astronauts mm. to the space station and back. We depend on, on the Russian Soyuz uh, shuttle. That, that is utterly unacceptable. I am looking forward to hopefully very soon having the capacity for commercial crew to get back and forth. But that certainly has national security implications. And I'll tell you another area that has very significant national security implications uh, is, is the safety and security of our satellite network. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to chairing the Science and Space Subcommittee, I'm also on the Armed Services Committee, which obviously we deal very directly. So much of our national security is dependent on space. You look at GPS, you look at technology, you look at targeting, you look at communications. And uh, the development that other countries are making in space weaponry to take out mm -hmm. our communication equipment it, it, it is truly chilling. I will tell you some of the classified briefings 
would take your breath away uh, at, at the potential threats we face. Uh, and I think we need to have serious investments to ensuring that other countries cannot take out our satellite uh, infrastructure up, upon which so much of modern commerce, modern life, um, you know, you look at, at, at all of the things that depend on, on, you know, whether it's filling your car at a gas station, and without satellites you can't run the credit card and put gas in your car, or, or taking out 50 bucks from an ATM. Uh, you know, with, with our satellite infrastructure being vulnerable, the basic steps of, of, of commerce and life are, are threatened profoundly, and I think we need serious investment uh, to address that vulnerability. Uh, Senator, I know you have to go in a minute, but I want to ask you before you go, how you hold in tension two objectives, one where, as you say, uh, our national security very much does depend on our satellites not being able to, say, be lasered out of the sky. Right. Um, but how do you avoid an arms race in space where you have, like, a, a militarization regime? Well, listen, that, that is a very real concern, uh, but we also have to acknowledge the realities which is that other countries, including China, including Russia, are making significant investments in, in those regards. And, and so, you know, I think sticking our head in the sand and, and saying we don't want an arms race, so we're just going to ignore the threats, uh, that's not a prudent step. Uh, and, and, you know, I'll, 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 I'll use that question to sort of share an anecdote. You know, you think back to America's leadership in space, and much of it has its genesis with John F. Kennedy and his bold leadership, but even before that, uh, the reaction mm -hmm. to Sputnik. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a couple of months ago, I, I took my daughters to see the movie Hidden Figures, uh, which I suspect an awful lot of folks <coughs> here have seen. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it is a wonderful, wonderful movie, uh, focusing on three African-American mathematicians at, at NASA in the 1960s who, who played a pivotal role in helping NASA ultimately have John Glenn orbit and, and eventually uh, landing, landing Americans on the moon. And it was wonderful to take my girls there and, and have them watch that movie. My girls are six and nine. And for one thing, uh, you know, the, the movie showed the racial discrimination and segregation in NASA. And, and for my girls, this was their first... This was actually the first non-animated movie they'd been to, and so they had, you know, <laughs> real actors and not uh, Disney. And, and, you know, I remember that night, my daughters coming home who were, you know, they were very puzzled. Mm -hmm. You know, why would you have this, this segregation and enormous discrimination? And we had, I think, really productive conversations at bedtime about the, 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 the sad and shameful history uh, that our country has had of, of discriminating against people based on race. But another big component, in addition to, to Caroline and Catherine, I brought Heidi, my wife, but I brought my mother. Mm -hmm. And my mom, uh, as I mentioned, uh, is a mathematician and was a computer scientist. And one of her first jobs was working at the Smithsonian, helping compute the orbits for Sputnik. And so the movie opens with, with exactly that. And so I talked to the girls and, and said, you know, Mimi, your grandmother, uh, was, was doing that. That, that. that was her job. And I asked my mom, I said, okay, how realistic was it about the barriers that, that, that women faced, what it was like in the work environment? Uh, and my mom said, you know, she thought the movie was very, very accurate. Um, you know, she started even earlier in, in the 1950s. And um, I commented to her, I said, you know, one thing that just seemed odd to a more modern ear uh, is that the mathematicians, they called them computers. Mm -hmm. In fact, there was a big sign, colored computers in their office. And, uh, and I said, look, you know, to, to a more modern ear, you think of a computer as a, a hunk of metal on your desk. And, and my mom laughed and she said her very first job title uh, was at Shell in 1956 and her job title was computer. And, and she was hired to be a computer. Uh, and, and uh, you know, that movie was a powerful illustration of what space can be, of the leadership that America can provide. And, you know, you talked about competition from other nations. You know, much of that was sparked by ensuring that America leads the world. That, that, that competition's a healthy thing. And, and, and it is my hope 
You asked about 15 years from now. 15 years from now, I hope to see NASA stronger. I hope to see us in a position to either have been to Mars or to be very close to going to Mars. And I hope to see the commercial space industry flourishing and growing orders of magnitude, investing billions and billions of dollars with all sorts of innovative discoveries that none of us can imagine right now. I hope the world 15 years from now includes discoveries and developments that, that, that are beyond our imagination. That's the promise of space exploration and America's continued leadership. Senator Cruz, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Ross. For our next session, Preparing the Body and Mind, please welcome Chris Lanehart, an assistant professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at George Washington University, Shana Gifford, a participant in the NASA-funded High Seas 4 mission, and Michael Lopez Alegria, a former NASA astronaut. Here to lead the conversation, please welcome back Allison Stewart. Oh, thank you, a gentleman, an astronaut and gentleman. Um, We've talked about the technology, we've talked about the politics, we've talked about the funding. Now we really should talk about the people who are going to have to do this and what they're going to have to endure and how they're going to have to train. Um, and everybody here has a really interesting perspective on it. So what I want to do is ask a couple individual questions and then have you all dive in. Um, and feel free to, to answer if you hear something that, that sparks um, something in your mind. Shana, let's start with you. Um, high seas is uh, on a volcano in Hawaii, Mauna Loa, and it is designed to simulate what it might be like for the people, the crew, that will ultimately wind up on Mars. So explain a little bit what your role was, what your everyday activities were like, and how that will inform what happens in 15 years. We'll go with 15 years. All right. <laughs> First question, although I'll make a comment, even though the base is on the volcano, there are no evil geniuses involved. <laughs> um, my, my role was the crew physician and the crew journalist. And yes, I play both sides perfectly comfortably. <clears throat> um, what we were there to do was mostly to look at the psychological aspects of a Mars mission. So up there at 8,200 feet in this 1,200 square foot geodesic dome, it looks to a certain extent like Mars, but you are still on Earth. So you're not testing differences in gravity and air pressure. You are testing differences in communication. You have a 20 minute delay each direction back to Earth and all of your communication. So it's an awfully long Skype call. Then you've got the interactions between the crew themselves. What is it like for six people to live in 1,200 square feet for an entire year? So what does it do to their bodies? What does it do to their minds? So we were basically there as a trial run, just like they did for Apollo, just like they did for Skylab, just like they did for the International Space Station. You test, you learn, and then you go for real. So what was the biggest hurdle physically for you over the course of the year, and then psychologically? The biggest hurdle physically for me, um, you know, I went to medical school, so being locked in a small place with smart people really wasn't that shocking. <laughs> um, I think for me as a physician, I was concerned that somebody would get injured. And you know, people talk, well, you're really on Earth, so it's not that dangerous. Being at the top of a mountain is relatively perilous. And I did not have blood to give or fluid. I mean, I had some fluids, but not much. I had basically no pain medication. So I really was concerned that in, in transiting the lava fields and going down into caves, there'd be a cave collapse or someone would have a terrible fall. So physically, I was concerned about my crew. Psychologically, I was concerned about my crew. Mm -hmm. That was my, my biggest holdup, really. I'd been on a previous um, mission for NASA, and as the people here can tell you, you get into a mode of being just very calm under, under stress, so that really wasn't an issue. I was mostly just concerned about what might happen to the people for whom I was responsible. Michael, you went through this in real life, in real space. Um, and I, we talked a little bit backstage about um, something that you feel needs to be explored a little bit more, especially when we're talking about the amount of time that these men and women will be spending, um, the psychological effects. What do you think needs to be considered when they go through the training? What are something that you experienced or some observation you've made or some feeling you have that really needs to be addressed well, when um, I'm asked about how hard was it to spend seven months up there without contact with your friends and family, the fact is it's 
not hard at all because you are in contact with your friends and family. So we had, of course, email. We had a telephone that we could literally pick up at that time almost any time and now certainly the vast majority of the orbit and call home. Call anybody, call any number on the planet and then, you know, play games about who's calling, please. <laughs> the point is um, we had very good communication infrastructure that allowed us to have that con and, um, converse those conversations. And as you heard before from Dr. Stofan, and I think Mary Lynn said it also, you know, 40-minute round trip, <clears throat> hello, what? And it's going to take a long time. So that's one aspect. The other thing is looking out at the planet is incredibly soothing. So we have this wonderful cupola that we can stick our noses up against. And that is by far the um, sp spare time number one thing to do is just look at the Earth go by. It's incredibly beautiful. And people on their way to Mars are not going to be able to do that. I mean, it's going to be daytime all the time. Um, they're, at some point, they're going to, if they can even look back toward Earth, they won't be able to tell which one of those dots is Earth. And I think that feeling is very, very different from anything we've experienced. So I, I think those considerations, um, in addition to all the other things that you've heard about all day, radiation, ECLIS, um, you know, the food supply, all those things are very important. What kind of psychological prep do you do for a mission like you were on? When we <clears throat> transitioned from flying the shuttle, which were roughly, you know, one week to two week missions to long duration flights, which began with the Shuttle Mir program um, in the mid 90s, we quickly realized that this is a different game. And we, um, we started developing almost a syllabus to prepare astronauts for what we call expedition behavior. So we start out with some lectures. It was actually fairly theoretical. And then we had a series of field exercises, the goal of which was to put, your, put you in an uncomfortable, physiologically uncomfortable environment. So you're, well, first of all, you're always hungry. Sometimes you're thirsty because you don't have water. Uh, sometimes you're cold, sometimes you're hot, but you're just not, you, you know, you've got less margin to deal with. And those stressors add up and almost everybody at some point sort of goes over the edge. And then you take a pause and you think about what are the coping mechanisms that I can learn and how am I going to deal with that if it happens to me on orbit. And then our sort of graduate exercise is something called NEMO, NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations, which is a, an underwater habitat off the coast of Florida. And we spend um, several weeks in isolation in there with a crew of four. Um, it's very much like uh, being on orbit because you're in saturation, so you can't, if you're out doing an EVA, which in that case is a, a dive, you can't just say, I'm tired of this and go up to the surface or you have serious, you know, you'll die. I mean, you may not die, but you'll be in rough shape. So um, that is sort of the culmination. And people um, experience different kinds of, uh, or different levels, I would say, of success in those things. And that helps in the selection process and deciding who needs further training. Shane, I saw you nod when the word stressor came up. Why did you do that? Um, because the stressors occur both naturally and, as Michael was just describing, some of them are pre-scripted. So when I was on our asteroid mission, and you're right, after Earth and, and the Moon are the size of your thumb and then they fade away into the star field, it's a little bit weird. Your connection to Earth is just sort of not there. And the people over the radio can talk to you continuously, and then only every five minutes, and then only every ten minutes. And so it's just you and your crew forever, it seems, and that's the way it feels. I didn't find that very stressful. I actually did find that kind of interesting and soothing and then bizarre when we came back and Earth is enormous again. Mm -hmm. um, but the stressors of not being able to pick up that phone and talk to your family are, are real and they're profound. And we had family things go, go on. Uh, my, my crewmate Cyprian was um, on the mission when there was the attack in Nice and he found out about it during dinner and Mission mm -hmm. Control had to call us and say, we're so sorry, we have to tell you about this. And he sat there in front of his computer, willing it to fork over information mm -hmm. about his friends and family. I think he sat there all night, frankly, because it was nighttime in, in Europe by that point. My grandmother died while I was on mission. Mm -hmm. I said goodbye to her over delayed video. And that's not something you ever want to do, but it's something you do and life goes on. And that morning I got up and I did my job. And so those stressors are real not pre-scripted, and then there are these scripted stressors that we go through in preparation. So the stress is real, but it's, it's doable, it's workable. Chris, I want to bring you into the conversation to talk about sure. the physical stresses. When I was Googling around and researching and reading, of course, this, something popped up, a, a listicle, five ways Mars can kill you. <laughs> 
Uh, we've been through most of them, I think, during the course of uh, this afternoon. Um, radiation, obviously, being the most serious, or at least from a layman's person, radiation seems to be the most serious. What do you think is the most serious? I think that radiation is a good place to start. The, you've, you've heard some of our panelists and people speaking today about how we know a reasonable amount now about what the radiation exposure is like en route to Mars. Um, and that's thanks to the instrument that was placed on to Curiosity. Um, what we don't know is how space radiation affects human bodies. Um, so the study of radiobiology is the interaction of radiation with biological material. And the number of people who have been exposed to space radiation, truly exposed to space radiation in a fairly quantifiable level, the folks on the International Space Station are somewhat protected by being close to Earth and close to the sun. So the idea that we need to go with biological tissue out beyond the International Space Station to the moon, beyond the moon, and actually see what happens to biological material, whether it's human or otherwise, is important information. We try to do it on Earth, but we can't really do it very well. We can simulate some space radiation on Earth in some laboratories, and some of the studies that have done that are actually kind of alarming. So if you take simulated space radiation and you expose the brain of a rodent to that radiation, that rodent's not very smart anymore and can't go through the maze. And we don't know if that's gonna happen to people. You don't wanna be seven months on the way to Mars and realize that you don't know what switch to throw because you don't know what checklist to look at because you can't remember your training. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you teach about is adaptability, that the human body is amazing at adapting. Um, is that a pro or a con when we're talking about Mars? Uh, it has to be a pro. Um, we could never go to Mars unless we were able to adapt to our environment. So we are the dominant species on this planet because we adapt. We adapt really well physically, but then we also use our brains to adapt when we can't physically do what we need to do. And uh, the, the adaptations that are required to go to Mars uh, are gonna be really profound. And you've heard about the stressors and the psychological issues. Those are going to be a big challenge. Um, beyond that, we have to deal with the effects of prolonged microgravity. So if you are spending seven to nine months flying to Mars in what is essentially zero gravity, your bones don't like that, your muscles don't like that, your heart doesn't like that. Um, we have to find ways to overcome those issues. And exercise is what we do on the International Space Station. That's a great option, except now we're talking about a much smaller space and we're talking about not being able to have all the equipment that we currently have on Space Station. So we're just starting to figure out how to deal with muscle and bone loss on Station, and now the moment we start going further away, we're suddenly gonna have to figure it out all over again because we can't take any of the stuff that we wanted to take with us because we don't have enough space to do it. How were you physically when you came back? I was a little tired. <laughs> I, um, I, they say anecdotally that it takes about a day on Earth for every day you're in space. And I would say that's about right. And that's to get sort of back to 100%. Now, you recover pretty quickly. There's a few things. I mean, the first thing is your sense of um, orthostatic intolerance, which means that when you stand up, you feel like you're gonna fall over because you're faint. And in general, that's a matter of minutes to hours before that's fixed. Then you have the, the issue of, um, of being able to stand up, of having a sense of balance. So you're, you're um, I, I don't really know the medical terms behind it, maybe Chris could help me, but <laughs> what I, w the way I describe it to people is that when you first get to space, your eyes are telling you one thing and your head is telling you something else. Your head, meaning the, uh, the inner ear, is sort of saying there is no up and there is no down, but your eyes are saying, well, there is up because all the writing on the lockers is oriented this way, so that must be up. Turns out your ear is right, but your but your brain ends up believing your eyes. And when you so they disconnect those two channels. They don't talk anymore. You just start thinking about what your eyes are telling you. When you come back, it takes a long time to, for those things to reconnect. And until then, if you close your eyes, you just fall over because your, your uh, inner ear is not, feed that feedback channel is gone. That takes a week um, for short duration flight, maybe three or four days. For long duration flight, maybe a week or two at the most. But the pervasive thing is sort of this sense of fatigue and weakness. I mean, obviously, um, things are heavier on Earth than they are in space. And uh, 
I, I can tell you that there, there's a, literally an instance where I let a glass go because I thought it would stay there and it didn't. Um, so that really feels to me like it took about six or seven months where I could uh, really feel like, okay, now I'm completely back to normal. It's as if uh, I never left. Shannon, I'm going to ask you two questions. One thing I want people to understand, when Shannon was in uh, this, this um, <clears throat> environment, for when you would go out, you would have to suit up. It was to simulate everything. For example, if you were going to go out and do rock collection, you had to put the suits on, everything like that. Mm -hmm. Tell us what that experience was like. And did you feel freer when you were outside of the structure? Hmm, that's a great question. You know, you don't get the wind in your face, wind in your face, or the sun on your skin for a year done and done, or in the case of Mars, three years. Do you feel freer when you're wearing 50 pounds and trying to navigate over lava? I would say not especially. <laughs> um, the 50 pound suit that I'm referring to is, is the one that we've designed since coming back, but the, the intention right now with, with the Z2 suit is that it will be about 50 pounds in Martian gravity. That's a heavy, heavy suit. But you're wearing a spaceship. So there you are in your personal spaceship, roving over the lava, hoping it won't collapse under you, because this is not a known territory. And I was in a lava collapse at one mm -hmm. point. I felt, felt about a meter. So you feel like you're in a little bit of peril, but at least you have this unbounded horizon, rather than the 12 steps it takes to go from one end of your dome to the other. So you go from being in a 12-step wide environment to an infinite step wide environment, but now you're in a spacesuit, in a spaceship on ground that might collapse. So it, it's a different environment. The perils are different. Your senses are more alive and awake. Let me tell you the most fun part though is going out at night. Going out at night in a spacesuit and lying underneath the stars on top of the volcano and watching the arm of the galaxy rise is one of the most beautiful things in the world. It, you know, they, they radio, you ready to come in? No. <laughs> and as you're just lying on your side and the only sound you hear is the fan blowing, circulating your air and you're just watching the stars rise. That's very freeing. But otherwise, you're just acutely aware of the fact that you're in a spaceship and, uh, you know, right here is death. Yeah. Chris, um, sound is a big issue, I've heard. Is that the sense that takes the biggest beating? You're, you're, the noise in a spacecraft, Mike, has lived this. Um, it, it's perpetual. Um, there is so much machinery, there's so many electronics, there's so many things happening constantly um, that it is a uh, constant assault on your brain. Um, and it is, it takes a, a psychological toll on you, um, but it also takes a, a physical toll as well. And one of the big challenges is how do we control that environment to make it as quiet as possible, but it still needs to be functional. Mm -hmm. And so there are limits that are set for space travel. So on the space station, there is a, a general limit for how noisy it's allowed to be, and it can peak and it can go up and down at times. But your brain is constantly trying to process that signal, that noise that just won't go away, and it's very fatiguing, and it can affect your ability to do your, your tasks. So it, it affects crew performance, but it also just annoys people. Yeah, I would, I would actually um, nominate a second sense that takes a beating, and that's your vision. So for um, when we started doing these long duration flights, it, it took uh, not very many increments before we realized that folks were coming back some people with uh, pretty degraded visual acuity. Hmm. I'm talking shifts uh, of up to two diopters in um, near si or far sighted shifts, so plus two diopters in the space of six months. Um, often it coincides with people, you know, when they get to the age where they're presbyopic and they, you know, their arms get too short, but that's a pretty dramatic shift. So, um, and we don't know what's going on yet. I mean, we thought we had it, uh, they actually call it visual impairment intracranial pressure, but now intracranial pressure may not be the, um, the culprit. So um, this is something that's gonna be an issue. And, and now people are flying with um, different degrees of prescription lenses to accommodate a potential shift as they get up there. It's um, pretty dramatic.
Mm -hmm. I would nominate, I guess, a fourth sense after the vestibular system and the visual system and the auditory system, and that's your olfactory system. Your sense of smell takes one heck of a beating, too. As the one who had to clean the composting toilets, <laughs> I can attest to that. Um, but your sense of smell is linked to your sense of taste. Your sense of taste is linked to your desire to eat. Your desire and ability to eat is linked to your physiological well-being, and your physiological well-being is linked to your psychological well-being. So your sense of smell actually has this profound effect on your overall ability to stay healthy and continue to do your tasks. I'm going to ask one or two more questions and then take questions from the floor because we've got about five minutes left. Chris, I asked you backstage, what is something you think is not discussed enough when we talk about, or just doesn't get on the table when we talk about dur long duration space travel? And it was quite interesting what you said. So uh, I teach a graduate course about human health in space. And uh, one way to get my students' attention is to tell them that we're going to talk about sex in space. <laughs> um, but, but it's not meant to be salacious necessarily. It's, it's a real concern. Um, one thing that we say we don't know enough about biology and nutrition and all these different things in spaceflight, something we really don't know about is human reproduction in space. Um, not only how our reproductive systems adapt to the space environment, but if we actually want to go places and we want to stay there, if we're talking about colonization, there's a key component to colonization that makes it possible, and that is having babies. Um, and this is something that we frankly have never studied dramatically um, because it's not been relevant to date. Um, but if we want to become a spacefaring species and we want to live in space permanently, this is a crucial issue that we have to, that we have to address that just has not been uh, fully studied yet. Do we have any questions from the floor? Who's got the mic? Uh, Jen Moore with pedestrians.org. Uh, we have had experience over the years with um, you know, Antarctica in winter for isolation, submarines for confined spaces. How are we able to build on what we learned in those environments with what we're doing now, getting ready for space? Well, I we can start with the example of the environmental control and life support systems on ISS um, are, and on any vehicle, are um, model to some degree, at least from a submarine, because those are obviously closed loop systems. Now there's obviously water and things like that available to the submarine that are not, and we, we just can't um, reach out into the vacuum and get any of the resources. But all those things are um, elements that build upon one another, and I think we've learned a great deal from the, the precursors. Uh, hi, I'm Amanda Dean Ahmed, and I was fascinated by Michael's comment about the tendency to become farsighted mm -hmm. in space. I know in the past, a prerequisite for astronauts was they have perfect vision. For the Mars mission, should we consider hiring people who are nearsighted so they can come back with normal vision? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I think that's an interesting point, uh, not that one specifically, but it, <laughs> it brings up this uh, ethical question about how, what kind of screening do we do um, for that type of mission? As Chris was mentioning, we really don't understand the effects of radiation on, on tissue, and, and there are different effects on different organs. So you could um, genetically screen people who are more or less susceptible to different kinds of cancers based on the type of radiation environment that we predict. So that kind of ethical question, and it's sort of anecdotal, but you may have heard that there's a, a debate about whether sh we should give people um, appendectomies you know, just in case, because that's, that's a big problem that we'd have to face, and why not eliminate one more risk? Yeah, and do we recruit people who all have the same blood type to go? And perfect teeth. <laughs> and the appendectomy question is something we face for Antarctica as well, to answer the, the previous question. And the Australians do, I think, still require mm -hmm. people to have their appendixes removed, which is interesting because after the age of 40, appendicitis really falls off. So what's the age of your astronauts? Really. So um, recruiting people based on their current physical condition to then send them into a vast unknown wilderness where the physical challenges are not entirely known is a bit of a gamble. You should probably send tech to deal with whatever you might come up with rather than having to rely on the current state maintaining itself for three years. We have a question here. Hi, uh, Justin Park, Intergalactic Education. Uh, this is more of a moral question too. Uh, won't the first child being born in space be like a major step uh, for humanity? And, and what's holding us back from, from doing that? 
uh, what's holding us back from doing that? Oh, well, um, no, no, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. I, I think that it, in theory, it, it would be an amazing step for humanity, and it would potentially be a point where we don't even know if a baby born in space, whether it's in microgravity or on the surface of a, a celestial body, we have no idea how they're gonna develop. Um, will they develop bones the way that, that we do? Would they ever be capable of coming to Earth and actually standing up? Um, so we're basically at that point talking about people who are going to be, if they exist in the future, are gonna be vastly different from, from what we are. Um, and that may be a, kind of a turning point in human history. And I'm gonna ask one last question and I'm glad you brought it up. Um, I want each of you to uh, tell us what you think is an ethical consideration that needs to be made by NASA or SpaceX or whomever is going to have this first mission. What, what is something that you think is an ethical quandary or question or consideration they should be thinking about and asking themselves? You want to start, Chris? Sure. Uh, I actually, this is an exercise I go through with my graduate course. Um, we talk about, Mike would have more intimate detail about this than I would, but what do you do if one of your crew members is sick or injured um, and you can't save them? Uh, at what point you're transiting to Mars, you're halfway there, someone becomes sick, you're trying to heal them and, and make them better, and you're using up all of your resources to do it. At what point do you stop taking care of that person and saving your resources because the mission comes first? And that, the concept there is that it's called operational medicine. And the idea is that you have to have these discussions before you go. You have to think through these parameters and these scenarios, and you have to be prepared for them uh, and realize that, that something terrible may happen and you have to be able and willing to deal with it when it does arise. Shana, what do you think? That's a great question. I, I've actually been asked that question repeatedly, is when do you let people go and under what circumstances? And even if operational medicine states, we're gonna let somebody go because they're a crew person down, the person taking care of them is a crew person down, so now you're way down. Uh, what does that do to the crew psychologically? Mm -hmm. But my actual uh, ethical question is, what information do you keep from a deep space crew? Do you mm -hmm. tell them that their child is sick? Do you tell them that their mother has passed? Do you tell them that there's been an attack in their city? Or do you keep that information back because they have a really important DVA tomorrow and you want them focused? We started wondering that when the Nice information came through and said, you know, if we'd had something to do first thing in the morning, that would have really been a hit on our performance. So what do we even want to know? And what do they decide that they can and can't tell us? And how do they decide that? Michael, let you have the last word on this. So, that, I mean, that's a real thing, and we deal with that in now because uh, we have that conversation. Each person, each crew member is asked that, you know, if, if there is news like that, do you want to know or do you not want to know? And it's obviously different for every person. Um, my contribution to that um, conversation would be, and, and it's very real, so the, basically the consensus is that with today's propulsion and what it would take to get a vehicle to Mars um, anytime soon, the um, amount of radiation would ex that a person would receive would exceed what NASA is okay with um, allowing somebody to do now. So we would have to, as a nation, have a, an ethical conversation about we are now going to change the standards. I think the consensus is that you probably, you, you almost certainly wouldn't get enough radiation to affect your performance on the mission, but you almost certainly would get enough radiation to affect your longevity to some degree. And those, there are metrics for that. And right now the, the NASA administrative standard says that we can take a such and such percent increase of risk over the normal mortality from cancer. That number would have to be a lot higher. And that is a conversation that has, has yet to happen, but it's gonna have to happen sometime soon. Many more conversations to come. Unfortunately, my clock says zero, 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 which means we're out of time. Please thank our panel and everyone who was involved today. It's a great day. Please welcome back to the stage, Margaret Lowe.
That is a wrap. Thank you so much, Shana, Chris, Michael, and thank you, too, to Allison and all our journalists and speakers. This was an inspired afternoon talking about the return to deep, deep space and ending with a conversation that was eye-opening about the human toll that uh, space takes on the people who go there. Uh, the words of NASA's Robert Lightfoot echoed for me throughout the day when asked why space exploration is such a bipartisan undertaking, he said, it's written in our hearts. We want to explore. And then he went on to ask, can you imagine the first step on Mars? And he credited the, the human race, not just one country, for pulling off the moon landing. He said, it will be the same when we get to Mars. Thank you so much, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, for making this afternoon possible. And my thanks to everybody here. Uh, you've been an incredibly uh, wonderful and attentive audience, and I credit you greatly for that. Uh, I'm actually standing between you and a cocktail. Uh, but before I let you go, I'm going to make one more request. You have on your chairs when you came in uh, a short survey, and you'll also get an email from me momentarily if you haven't already. It's always amazing. Uh, if you would take a little moment to fill that out, I promise it'll just take you a minute or two your feedback is really important to us. So off you go to the terrace for a drink. Thank you so much for a great afternoon. <laughs>